for tonight's event, we have the privilege of welcoming as our moderator, our very own Dr. S. Scott Barchi. Dr. Barchi is a UCLA professor of history, of religion, and Christian origins, and the director of the Center for the Study of Religion. This quarter, he's teaching an upper division course, Jesus of Nazareth in recent research. An honors graduate of Milligan College, he earned his MDiv from Harvard Divinity School and his PhD in New Testament and Christian origins from Harvard University. He is the author of First Century Slavery and the Interpretation of 1 Corinthians 7.21. Since the original appearance of his book, Barchi has continued to publish his research on ancient slavery, gender roles, and community formation in relation to Paul's letters and the traditions about Jesus of Nazareth. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Scott Varchi. While I explain how the evening is laid out, thank you very much for that welcome. Uh, could I ask the people who are in charge of the PowerPoint to uh, put up the information on our first speaker? Mr. Lacona, is it there now? Is that what we want? That's what you want. That's what he wants. Okay. Okay. Here's, here's, here's what we're going to do. In the first hour, um, our two speakers will each have 20 minutes uh, to make an opening statement, and then they will have each have 10 minutes uh, to respond, so that will take us for, through the first 60 minutes. Uh, then we'll have a little transition where you'll have an opportunity to write your questions on cards. We'll ask those cards will be distributed, and we will ask you to write one question per card and indicate on that card to whom you're addressing uh, the question. If it's to both people, then, uh, then uh, please say so, uh, but you can address it to one or the other. Uh, then we'll have a break of about 10 minutes, and I'm going to be pretty rigorous on that. Uh, some of you who were here last year remember that one of our breaks seemed to take forever. Uh, but we're going to, so don't go far, uh, and uh, be back in the seats in about 10 minutes. And then our speakers will have another 10 minutes uh, uh, to discuss with each other. And then each will have five minutes to wrap it up uh, to what they're going to be saying before you get in on the action. So that'll take us about 30 minutes. And then uh, uh, we'll take a break to, you'll, in a sense, that you can sort of mill around in your seats, and we'll collect the cards, get ourselves organized for the last part of the evening. Uh, I've been given the privilege of asking the first couple of questions, and then after that, that'll be all yours, and um, you can enter into the discussion and, and uh, ask whatever uh, questions uh, seem to be reasonable to ask. I'll be sorting them. I'll be trying to put the questions together to see if we can get as many people's inquiries uh, before our uh, distinguished speakers as possible. So if there's any questions about that, you can ask me after the first hour because that's pretty well set now. Each of the speakers will have 20 minutes uh, to make their initial presentations and then after that, uh, 10 minutes each then to respond to each other. Uh, at this time, I will introduce our first speaker and then so that the introduction is right close to when he's speaking, I'll wait until um, the second speaker is prepared to come forward uh, to speak before I uh, introduce him particularly. So our first speaker is a New Testament historian who has a Master of Arts degree in Religious Studies uh, from Liberty University and is now a PhD candidate in New Testament Studies at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. He is a member of the Society of Biblical Literature and of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. Uh, he is the author of three books, the most recent being The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. Uh, one of the most esteemed persons in this field of inquiry is a man by the name of Gary Habermas. Professor Habermas remarks uh, that, in my opinion, uh, Mike Lacona's knowledge of the case for Jesus' resurrection places him among an elite number of evangelicals who are writing on this subject today. Our speaker lives in Virginia Beach with his wife, Debbie, and two children. And uh, he has a website uh, that you can learn more about, simply called risenjesus.com. So please join me in welcoming to this uh, podium, Mike Lacona. Thank you, and good evening. It's great to be with you. I'd like to thank Veritas Forum here at UCLA for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate. I'd also like to thank Richard Carrier for the cordial and open email correspondences we've shared prior to tonight's debate. The question before us is, did Jesus rise from the dead? 
And for me, this is one of the most interesting as well as important topics for discussion. Let me explain why. About 20 years ago, I went through a period of intense questioning of my faith. I was in graduate school at the time, specializing in the study of New Testament Greek and planning on going into the ministry. But at that time, I began asking uh, the tough question, how can I know if Christianity is true? I believed I had an intimate relationship with God at that time, but I started to wonder, is this really the case, or was I really just self-deluded? So I took a step back from my position of confidence and began to look at Christianity, as well as the evidence uh, for many of the major world religions. I also considered the arguments for atheism. And after several years, I came to the conclusion that what I had originally believed had been revealed to me by God's Spirit had now been manifested, or, or I should say confirmed, by history, science, and philosophy. Namely, that God exists, and that he has actually revealed himself to mankind in Jesus Christ, and that Christianity is true. The case for the resurrection of Jesus was especially influential in my decision. Now, the reason Jesus' resurrection is so important is because the truth of Christianity hinges on it. Jesus' atoning death and subsequent resurrection have been bedrock doctrines of Christianity since its beginning. If they didn't occur, the foundation collapses and Christianity is false. The Apostle Paul himself wrote, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. On the other hand, if Jesus was actually resurrected, then it seems there's good reason for believing that Christianity is true. Given this, I think we have a problem if we say, well, my worldview just doesn't allow that. Well, if that's the position you find yourself in, it may be time to change your worldview. That's why this evening's discussion is much more than just an academic debate. The eternal destiny of our souls may very well hinge on what we do with Jesus and his resurrection. So where do we begin? Historical Jesus studies. The eminent historical Jesus scholar, John Meyer, explains it like this. Let's say we have a Jew, an agnostic, and a Christian. This is not a joke. A Jew, an agnostic, and a Christian, all honest historians, all well acquainted with first century religious movements, lock them up in the Harvard Divinity School Library and tell them that they can't come out until they've hammered out a consensus document on what we can know about Jesus apart from theological or faith considerations. That resulting document would portray what scholars refer to as the historical Jesus. Now the real Jesus who walked the shores of the Sea of Galilee may have been more than portrayed in that document, but he's nothing less. Tonight I'm going to focus on a few facts from this type of research that we can know with a high degree of historical certainty that concerns Jesus' resurrection. So obviously I'm not arguing that the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. It's more like what Tom Cruise said in the movie A Few Good Men, it doesn't matter what I believe, it only matters what I can prove. Let's look now at three facts that are strongly supported and acknowledged by an impressive majority of today's scholars. Fact number one, Jesus' death by crucifixion. Nearly 100% of all scholars agree with this conclusion. Let me provide four reasons why we can be confident of this. First, Jesus' death by crucifixion is multiply attested by both Christian and non-Christian sources. Second, the chances of surviving crucifixion, even under the best of conditions, were bleak. Crucifixion and the torture that usually preceded it was an unspeakably cruel process and may have been the worst way to die in antiquity. Many of us have seen Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, and have witnessed the brutal practice of scourging. This practice is likewise mentioned in um, ancient sources. For example, Josephus in the first century refers to a can you guys hear me out there? Okay. You can hear me? Okay, great. Josephus refers to a man who had been filleted to the bone. A second century document called the Martyrdom of Polycarp mentions how the Roman whip could expose a person's veins and arteries. The victim was then forced to carry his crossbeam outside the city walls where then Roman soldiers would take nails and impale a person to a cross or a tree. Then he was left hanging in excruciating pain. In fact, the word excruciating comes from the Latin, out of the cross. In the first century, a Roman historian named Seneca described a crucified victim as being long sickly, already deformed, swelling with ugly welts on shoulders and chest, and drawing the breath of life amid long drawn out agony. 
Josephus referred to crucifixion as the most wretched of deaths. Only one account exists of a person surviving crucifixion. Josephus reports of seeing three of his friends crucified. He ran to the Roman commander, uh, Titus, who was one of his friends, and, and uh, told him about it. And Titus ordered that the three be removed while alive and provided the best medical treatment Rome had to offer. In spite of this, two of the three died. Thus, even if Jesus had been removed prematurely, be it intentionally or unintentionally, his chances of survival were still very bleak. But to complicate the matters worse, there is no evidence whatsoever that Jesus was removed while alive or that he was provided any medical care whatsoever, much less Rome's best. Third, we can understand that while some debate remains among medical experts regarding the actual cause of death by crucifixion, they are nearly a single voice in saying that Jesus most certainly died from being crucified. The majority opinion is that he died by asphyxiation, and our understanding of crucifixion supports that conclusion. As the ninth, fourth, as the 19th century liberal scholar David Strauss noted, even if Jesus had somehow survived crucifixion, he couldn't have convinced his disciples that he had been resurrected in new life. Imagine Jesus half dead in the tomb, and so he wakes up in the dark and he wants to get out. So he takes his hands that have been pierced by nails, places them on an extremely heavy stone, and pushes it out of the way. And then he's met by the guards who say, where do you think you're going, pal? And he says, I'm out of here, guys. Then he beats them up. And then he walks blocks, blocks, if not miles, on pierced and wounded feet in order to find his disciples. Finally, he finds where they're at. Peter opens the door and sees Jesus hunched over in his pathetic and mutilated state and says, Wow, I can't wait to have a resurrection body like yours. <laughs> no, he would have said, Let's get you a doctor. You need help. As Strauss went on to say, There's no way that Jesus in his in the state could have convinced his disciples that he was the risen Lord of life. Alive? Barely. Risen? No way. In summary, we can know that Jesus died by crucifixion because it is multiply attested by both Christian and non-Christian sources. The chances of surviving crucifixion were bleak, even under the best of conditions. The uniform professional medical opinion is that Jesus died, and Strauss's critique that says even if Jesus had survived, he couldn't have convinced his followers that he had been resurrected. Thus, given a strong evidence for Jesus' death by crucifixion, without good evidence to the contrary, the historian must conclude that Jesus was crucified and that the process killed him. Even the highly critical co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, John Dominic Crossan, concludes that Jesus was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. On three occasions in the same book, Crossan also asserts that this event resulted in his death. Now, in his online writings, Richard creates an elaborate theory of how Jesus could have survived crucifixion, but in the end, he admits a probability of better than 98% that Jesus died while on the cross. Thus, I think it is quite clear. Jesus was crucified, and it's most plausible to conclude that the process killed him. Fact number two, the empty tomb. That Jesus' tomb was empty is agreed on by an impressive 75% of all scholars writing on the subject. Let me give you three arguments for the empty tomb. First, the Jerusalem factor. Now, Jesus was publicly executed, buried, and then his resurrection was first proclaimed in Jerusalem. It would have been impossible for Christianity to get off the ground if the body had still been in the tomb. All the Roman or Jewish authorities would have had to do is go to the tomb, exhume the body, tie his ankles together, drag him through Main Street in Jerusalem, and the hoax was over. But there's no evidence whatsoever that that occurred. Second, Jesus' enemies attest to the empty tomb. Justin and Tertullian report that members of the Jewish leadership were claiming that the disciples of Jesus had stolen his body. This is outside corroboration of Matthew 28, 13, and seems to be an attempt to account for a missing body. If my 10-year-old son went in and told his fourth grade teacher that the dog ate his homework, well, that would be implying that he, wasn't, he didn't have it to turn in. And likewise, for you wouldn't claim that the body was stolen if it was still in the tomb. Paul Meyer, distinguished professor of ancient history at Western Michigan University, writes, Jewish polemics shared with Christians the conviction that the sepulcher was empty but gave natural explanations for it. And such positive evidence within a hostile source is the strongest kind of evidence and becomes self-authenticating. Third, the concept of resurrection up until and even past the time of Jesus was that it was a bodily event. 
The eminent New Testament historian N.T. Wright has demonstrated this carefully in his new 800-page volume on the resurrection. See, pagans disavowed resurrection because they believed they would become a disembodied spirit after death. Jews held a couple of views. They were, there were the Sadducees, who didn't believe in life after death. Rather, they held that when you died, that was it. No heaven. So they were sad, you see. <laughs> Most Jews held that resurrection meant that the body that died was buried and is the same body that will be raised and transformed into an immortal body. Now, of course, if it's being claimed that the body that had died had also been raised, this implies belief in an empty tomb. Without a body, you might have said that Jesus was still alive as he claimed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were still alive. But you wouldn't have said resurrection. And as we will see in a moment, that is precisely what the first Christians were proclaiming. So we see that there's good evidence for the empty tomb. The Jerusalem factor, it's witnessed by Jesus' enemies, and the concept of resurrection implies an empty tomb. The Jewish scholar Geza Vermesh writes, When every argument has been considered and weighed, the only conclusion acceptable to the historian must be that the women who set out to pay their last respects to Jesus found to their consternation not a body, but an empty tomb. So here's where we are. We've established not only that Jesus died, but that his tomb was empty. But wait, there's more. Fact number three, something occurred that convinced a number of people, both friend and foe, that Jesus had been resurrected and had appeared to him. Nearly 100% again of all scholars who have studied the subject acknowledge this. Who were these people? I'd like to consider two categories, Jesus' friends and foes. First, Jesus' friends as disciples. At least two people who knew the disciples, Paul and Clement of Rome, reported they were claiming Jesus had been resurrected and had appeared to them. Scholars have also identified what they call kerygma, from the Greek word kerygma, which means an official or formal proclamation. Thus, kerygma refers to the official and formal proclamation of the disciples, or the first Christians. Kerygma is found in early traditions that predate the New Testament. Let me provide one of the main examples. That's found in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, or verses 3 through 7, that reads, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 at one time, most of whom are still alive, but some have died. After that, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And then Paul adds that he appeared to him too. Most scholars date this creed to within only a few years of Jesus' crucifixion and hold that it originated with the disciples. In fact, most hold that this list of appearances, with the exception of Paul, is the formal list that was proclaimed publicly by the disciples. I wish I had time to explain how scholars arrive at these conclusions because it's very interesting. I have to move on, but if Richard would like to question the conclusions of scholars on these points, I'd be happy to discuss it in the periods that follow. So we have the uniform testimonies of eyewitnesses and the earliest traditions that Jesus' disciples were claiming that he had been raised. But we can go further. At least seven sources in antiquity attest to their willingness to suffer and even die for this conviction. Now, of course, this doesn't prove their convictions were true, since people of other faiths are likewise willing to die for their convictions. However, it does indicate that they sincerely regarded their beliefs as being true. Liars make poor martyrs. So the original disciples not only claimed that the risen Jesus had appeared to them, they really believed it. The second category is Jesus' foes. It's very interesting that it wasn't just Jesus' followers who believed that he appeared to him, but also an enemy, Paul. Paul was a persecutor of the church, or of Christians. He arrested them, beat them, had them executed for being Christians. Then he became one because he believed the risen Jesus had appeared to him. What evidence do we have for this? Well, Paul himself testifies to it. Luke confirms it. And uh, we also have a very early oral tradition that predates the New Testament and says, he who persecuted the church now proclaims the faith he once sought to destroy. So we have early eyewitness and multiple testimonies to this fact. fact. Folks, this is the type of evidence historians drool over. Paul's sufferings and martyrdom on behalf of the Gospels are reported by at least seven sources attesting to the sincerity of his belief to have seen the risen Jesus. In addition to Paul, we might add that the skeptic James, the brother of Jesus, converted to Christianity shortly after Jesus' crucifixion because he too believed that the risen Jesus had appeared to him. 
Most scholars note the embarrassing testimony of the Gospels is that Jesus' brothers, including James, were unbelievers during his ministry. So it's quite interesting when a number of sources identify him later as a leader in the Jerusalem church. Moreover, in spite of Jesus being dead, James' new belief that his brother was the Messiah was so strong that he died as a martyr for it. It seems the best explanation for this change is found in the early creed in 1 Corinthians, mentioned a few moments ago, that states, after that, he appeared to James. So we've seen that Jesus' resurrection was believed by his disciples and at least one, if not two, of his foes. The critical scholar Paula Fredrickson of Boston University comments, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say, and then all the historic evidence we have afterwards attests to their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying they did, that they did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw. But I do know that as a historian, that they must have seen something. Now let's build a case for, the, for Jesus' resurrection. I provided three major historical facts that are strongly evidenced and are widely accepted by scholars. Jesus' death by crucifixion, the empty tomb, and the beliefs of a number of people, both friend and foe, that he had been resurrected and had appeared to him, them. In historical investigation, it's very rare that something can be conducted with absolute or 100% certainty. Because of this, the historian looks for high probability, the best explanation of the facts. So what about Jesus' resurrection? Certainly, it explains all of the facts and does so easily and without strain. But can any natural explanation account for them just as well? Can I explain these using other hypotheses, given what we know from science, history, philosophy, and psychology? In my judgment, the answer is no. It's not just that these hypotheses cannot account for all of the facts. Most of the time, it's the facts themselves that serve as refutations of them. For example, if it's proposed that the disciples stole the body and lied about the appearances, this wouldn't account for the conversions of the church persecutor Paul or the skeptic James, who would have been the first to suspect fraud. Thus, when it comes to Jesus' resurrection, naturalistic theories do three things. Fail, fail, and fail. But what about the fact that we're talking about a miracle? Is historical investigation possible when a miracle is involved? In my opinion, yes. Historical events never stand as islands. All occur within a context. And the context in which these three facts occurred was charged with religious significance. At minimum, scholars have established that Jesus believed he had a uniquely intimate relationship with God, that he was God's chosen uh, servant to usher in his kingdom, that he performed deeds that many interpreted as miracles, and that he predicted his violent death and vindication of God. It is within this environment that the evidence for Jesus' resurrection occurs and thereby uh, greatly increases the probability of the event being a miracle rather than a result of natural causes. This is especially strengthened when we consider that natural explanations are extremely improbable and unimpressive when trying to account for the known data. In conclusion, we've seen that there's good evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Moreover, Jesus' resurrection explains all of the facts without any strain. Since positive evidence exists for Jesus' resurrection, in the absence of a more likely theory, we can conclude with confidence that Jesus' resurrection was an event that occurred in history. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to, uh, to present to you our second speaker, uh, who is a historian and philosopher whose articles have appeared in many publications, including the Skeptical Inquirer and the Secular Web. He has earned an MA in Arts of History at Columbia University and an MA of Philosophy in Ancient History, and is currently working on his dissertation on Ancient Roman Science uh, at Columbia. His book, Sense and Goodness Without God, A Defense Without God, A Defense of Metaphysical Naturalism, as due out next year, along with an anthology titled Jesus is Dead, which includes three chapters by himself on the resurrection. He's been involved in online atheist-theist debates for over 10 years, has studied or reviewed numerous public debates, and has served as feedback editor and editor-in-chief of the secular web for many years. Uh, for Richard Carrier's online writings and links to his bio and homepage, you can go to infidels.org and all the things that are on that website. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Carrier. 
There are many theories contrary to what Mike has argued, but there isn't time tonight to look at them all. I will instead present the one theory I think is most probably correct, which I only have time to summarize. Shortly after the death of Jesus, his disciples prayed, meditated, and searched the scriptures for some meaning to justify the tragedy, and some way to preserve and promote the noble program of moral reform Jesus had died for. As a result, some had prophetic dreams or visions in which Jesus appeared to them, reassuring them and telling them just what they wanted to hear, that he had been raised by God so all who attached themselves to him and his moral program would participate in his resurrection as soon as this good news was preached to all Israel. The relevant content of this belief was that Jesus had been granted a new body by God, the resurrection body promised to all the faithful, abandoning his old body to the grave like a shell or husk to return to the dust from which it came. And this new, but the new body lived in heaven from where Jesus would soon return on clouds of glory to give us our own new bodies at the end of days. Such, I believe, was the original belief. But the church quickly fragmented into competing sects with different agendas. And over the first century, some groups became more and more Gnostic, while others became more and more sarcissistic. Gnosticism gravitated to the view that only the soul of Jesus was exalted, while sarcissism was the opposite view, that Jesus was raised only in the flesh, in the very same body that died and was buried. I believe both views are distortions of what the original Christians believed, yet both arose at roughly the same time and pace. Just as the Gnostics developed novel legends to explain and justify their view of things, so did the Sarcissists. The canonical gospels represent the parables and legends adopted or developed to serve the Sarcissist program, and that was uh, the one and only sect to obtain total power and preserve for posterity its documents and its own version of history. That is my theory in rough outline. Now I have to explain why my theory is a better explanation of the facts than Mike's. There are nine facts that together establish that my theory is more probably correct. Number one, Paul contradicts the Gospels of Luke and John by describing a spiritual resurrection. This is significant because Paul's letters predate the writing of the Gospels and are the only sources recorded within 20 years of the death of Jesus. In addition, unlike the authors of the Gospels, Paul's name and identity is known to us with relative certainty, and he alone names his sources and confirms them as eyewitnesses. Therefore, what Paul says carries far more historical authority than the relatively anonymous documents written down decades later that relied on unnamed and unverified sources. Since the most relevant passage from 1 Corinthians 15 is so important, I will read an abridgment of it as I have translated from the Greek. But someone will say, how are the dead raised, and with what kind of body do they come? You idiot, what you sow is not given life unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow the body that will come to be, but a naked seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body, just as he pleased, and to each of the seeds he gives a body all its own. Not all flesh is the same flesh, but there is one sort of flesh for men, another flesh for cattle, another flesh for birds, and another for fish. There are also bodies in heaven and bodies on earth, but the glory of the heavenly ones is beyond the glory of the earthly ones. There is one glory for the sun, another glory for the moon, etc. So also is the resurrection of the dead. A natural body is sown, but a spiritual body is raised. So also is it written, the first man, Adam, turned into a living life form, but the last Adam into a life-giving spirit. But the spiritual body is not first. Rather, first comes the natural body, then the spiritual body. The first man is made of dust from the earth. The second man is made of something from heaven. As is the one of dust, so also are those of dust. And as is the one in heaven, so also are those in heaven. And just as we once wore the image of the one of dust, let us also come to wear the image of the one in heaven. I say this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot receive the kingdom of God, nor does decay receive indestructibility. Look, I tell you a mystery. Not all of us will fall asleep, but we'll all be changed in an instant, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. That is what Paul wrote roughly 20 years after the death of Jesus. Note that Paul explicitly says the resurrected Jesus was a spirit and that flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom. In fact, earlier, Paul had even said that our resurrected body will not have a stomach and so will not eat food. And here he adds that it will be completely indestructible. 
That's what Paul says, and that is clearly how he understood the resurrection to be. Yet this contradicts what Luke and John say. Luke claims that Christ said, A spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And then he eats some fish to prove it. John claims the resurrected body of Jesus was still wounded, which cannot be if it was indestructible. So from Paul we learn that Jesus was a spirit, and had no stomach, and thus wouldn't eat, that his body could not be blemished, and that it did not consist of flesh or blood, but of some spiritual heavenly substance. Yet Luke and John claim Jesus did eat, did have blemishes, did consist of flesh and blood, and was not a spirit. Our earliest and most reliable record says one thing, and our later record says exactly the opposite. One of them must be wrong. And most likely, it's the later, less secure sources that have it wrong. Number two, Paul omits these very crucial claims of Luke and John. It is more probable that those claims were contrived after Paul's time than that they existed at the very origin of the church, and yet Paul had never heard of them. Since his discussion here in 1 Corinthians concerned answering questions about the nature of the resurrection body, it is hardly conceivable that Paul would fail to cite the most powerful and relevant evidence, physical eyewitness encounters revealing exactly what that body was like. Number three, Paul declares that Christ's resurrection was just like ours will be, but he describes our resurrection in terms that can only be understood as exchanging one body for another, not changing the same body into something else. Paul explicitly says, the body that dies is not the body that will rise, but God provides its own body. Paul takes great pains to explain that there are many different bodies, especially between bodies in heaven and on earth, and that our new bodies will be spiritual bodies, composed of the same stuff of the glorious stars. Paul goes out of his way to assert that the spiritual body comes after the natural body that dies. In all this, he specifically avoids ever simply saying that the natural body will become a spiritual body. He doesn't say that. His whole discourse emphasizes difference in substance and origin. Dust belongs to the earth, spirit belongs to heaven. It follows that the body of dust must be left behind, that this is the only way to enter the heavenly realm of the indestructible. As Paul says, we will put on our new bodies like new coats, suggesting the old coat will be left behind. In fact, in Paul's phrase, we'll all be changed, he uses the Greek word alagesamatha, which does not mean change in the sense of changing one thing into another, but is instead the verb of mercantile exchange, of trading one thing for another. This two-body doctrine was the view held by the Essene Jews, the one sect that had the most in common with the early Christian church. And it was also held by a prominent first century Jew, Josephus, a Pharisee who specifically explains that our current bodies are inevitably corruptible and must return to the earth from which they came. So God will give us new, better bodies and in the resurrection. Philo, another Jew and a contemporary of Paul, also held to a similar view. And Josephus and Philo often use the very same concepts and language as Paul. Thus, there is a good probability that Paul shared their view and understood the resurrection just as they did, as an exchange of an old shell of a body for a new heavenly body. This would explain one peculiar fact about the letters of Paul, why he never once mentions the empty tomb or any details of the empty tomb story. Because the tomb wasn't empty, rather the corpse was empty, for the spirit of Jesus had been transported into a new body in heaven, just as Josephus, Philo, and the Essenes all believed would happen, and just as Paul seems to have described. Now, later stories in the Gospels about an empty tomb and appearances are the only evidence Mike has against my theory. But my theory is based on earlier and more reliable evidence, has precedence in early Jewish thought, and already has the greater probability. It is the best and simplest explanation for what Paul both says and doesn't say. But there is more evidence that the empty tomb story is, more probably than not, a legend which probably began as a literary symbol and not a claim to historical fact, and that the original appearances were more probably than not ordinary religious visions, later embellished to support the Sarcissist dogma. So now to those facts. Number four. Throughout history, we have found that the frequency of amazing but true stories is low, very low. Such stories are rare, while the frequency of myths, legends, and tall tales is very high. Such stories are common. It follows that the probability that any amazing story will be false is higher than the probability it will be true. That doesn't mean every amazing story is false, only that this is more likely. Nor does this mean that we can never prove an amazing story true, 
uh, it, only that we need especially strong evidence to overcome their low probability. In contrast, my theory rests on what is already the most probable, given what we know about history in general. Number five, there is insufficient evidence to overcome the low probability that the empty tomb story is true. Being an amazing story, it is already likely to be false. To prove it is not, we need some good evidence. But the evidence we have is not at all good. In fact, it is among the worst we can have for any historical claim. There are five kinds of evidence we can have in history, and the more and better evidence we have from this list, the more certain we can be that a claim is true. Uh, as an example, I will compare the claim that the tomb of Jesus was found empty with the claim that Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon. First, the physical historical necessity of this event is exceedingly great. The history of Rome could not have proceeded as it did had Caesar not physically moved an army into Italy. He could not have captured Rome or conscripted Italian men against Pompey's forces in Greece. In contrast, the discovery of an empty tomb is not necessary. For as we have seen, the original belief may well have been that Jesus switched bodies and appeared in visions. That would be sufficient to get the religion started. Thus, an empty tomb is not necessary to explain all subsequent history, unlike Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon. Second, in Caesar's case, we have lots of direct physical evidence. We have a number of inscriptions and coins produced soon after the Republican Civil War related to the Rubicon crossing. In contrast, we have no physical evidence of any kind supporting the empty tomb. No papyri survive and no inscriptions were commissioned by the resurrected Jesus or by the early church or by witnesses like Peter or Joseph of Arimathea. Third, for Caesar, we have unbiased corroboration. Even Caesar's enemies like Cicero reported the crossing of the Rubicon as did other hostile or neutral observers. Whereas we have no hostile or even neutral records of an empty tomb by any non-Christian until well after the Christians started telling the story, after Paul's death, and long after any facts could be checked. Fourth, we have several crit credible, critical accounts of the Rubicon crossing by known scholars of the time, Suetonius, Appian, Cassius Dio, Plutarch. And we know a lot about who they were and their scholarship. They often quote and name many different sources, showing a wide reading of witnesses and documents, and they critically examine several disputed claims. They also cite or quote texts written by witnesses and contemporaries, hostile and friendly, of the Rubicon crossing and its repercussions. In contrast, we have not even a single skilled historian mentioning the empty tomb until centuries after the fact. While of those who mention the empty tomb within the first century, none show any wide reading, never name any sources, show no sign of a skilled or critical examination of conflicting claims, have no detailed scholarship to their credit that we can test for their skill and accuracy, are essentially unknown, and have an overtly declared bias towards persuasion and conversion. Fifth, there is an eyewitness account, for we have Caesar's own word on the subject. Indeed, the book, The Civil War, has been a Latin classic for 2,000 years. In contrast, we have nothing written by Jesus, nor any record of the empty tomb by eyewitnesses like Peter. And we do not know for certain the name or identity of any author of any of the accounts of the empty tomb that we do have, much less the name of any of their immediate sources. It should be clear that we have many reasons to believe Caesar crossed the Rubicon, all of which are lacking in the case of the empty tomb. In fact, when we compare all five points, we see that in four of them, the empty tomb has no evidence at all, and in the one proof that it does have, it has not the best, but the very worst kind of evidence, a handful of late, biased, uncritical, unscholarly, unknown, second-hand witnesses. That's not good evidence. Even seen in the best possible light, the evidence available is simply not sufficient to establish that there really was an empty tomb. Number six, the Gospels themselves show signs of an increasing rate of legendary development. ...rise of newfangled Gospels containing false claims, including myths and clever fabrications. We should certainly expect this only grew worse after Paul's day, when our Gospels were finally written. The first Gospel, Mark, tells a simple story about women going to the tomb and finding it open, meeting a single boy in white, then running off. The whole account is probably a parable and never intended to be read as history. But in the Gospel of Matthew, which simply borrowed from Mark and added to it, the boy has become an angel descending from heaven. The women experience a massive earthquake and watch the angel descend and see it open the tomb. Guards have been added to the story, and the women run off but now get to meet Jesus on the way. 
Can we doubt that we are looking at extensive legendary embellishment upon what began as a much more mundane story? We can see the same trend in Luke. Mark's one boy in white has been multiplied into two men who suddenly appear in dazzling apparel. Now we hear that Peter went to check the tomb and confirmed it was empty. And Jesus appears in the flesh and invites his disciples to touch him and eats fish to prove he's real, then whooshes up into heaven before their very eyes. That again sounds like a pretty fancy embellishment of Mark's far more humble story. In John, Jesus receives an absurdly fabulous burial. Peter again goes to see for himself, but this time yet another disciple goes too. Luke's two men now become two angels, and we get the elaborate tale of the doubting Thomas putting his fingers inside the wounds on Christ's body and Jesus declaring, blessed are they who believe without seeing. All this certainly looks like a growing legend. Number seven, we have found that genuine supernatural encounters must be extraordinarily rare, since despite 200 years of detailed scientific investigation, we have yet to confirm a single genuine case. In contrast, across the whole spectrum of human history and culture, inspiring religious dreams and hallucinations are quite common. Indeed, they are most frequent in cultures that elevate the status of such experiences, like the ancient world and we have numerous examples of powerful dreams and hallucinations of pagan deities. We have also established the psychological and neurophysical basis of religious hallucination. It follows that the probability any appearance of God will really be a dream or hallucination is much higher than the probability of a genuine encounter with God. That doesn't mean every such encounter is false, only that this is more likely. Nor does this mean that we can never prove such an encounter genuine, only that we need especially strong evidence to overcome its low probability. In contrast, my theory rests on what is already the most probable given what we know about human nature, the human brain, and the history of religions and ancient culture. Number eight, Paul describes the appearances of Jesus in terms more consistent with a vision than a physical body. He places himself on the list of witnesses to the risen Christ along with Peter, James, and everyone else. And in Paul's letter to the Galatians, he says, I neither received the gospel from a man nor was I taught it except through a revelation of Jesus Christ. A revelation, he specifically says, was not an encounter with flesh and blood. And the book of Acts describes Paul's experience as a vision, just a light and a voice, commonplace features of hallucination. That our earliest and best evidence would be of this character, while the only evidence of a more physical encounter with Jesus comes much later from much less secure sources, is more probable if the original experiences were in fact like Paul's vision and less probable if they were like what some Gospels strive to depict. Number nine, Mark and Matthew don't mention Jesus appearing in the flesh, and Luke and John share the detail that Jesus suddenly appeared and disappeared on some occasions, as one would expect of a vision, and on other occasions appeared as someone else whose face no one recognized, which was a common motif in ancient religion, the God or angel appearing in disguise to test us. In contrast, details supporting a resurrection of the flesh arise only in Luke, and then appear in John, who is not an independent source since he borrowed many unique scenes from Luke. That our only evidence for a resurrection of the flesh would be entirely traceable to only one source, which we know came later than and embellished upon a source excluding those details, is more probable if it's a late fabrication and less probable if it was part of the original tradition. So those are the nine facts that support my theory more than Mike's. There's a lot more but I've outlined the main reasons for believing as I do. That we would have those facts rather than others is more probable if my theory is true and less probable if Mike's theory is true. So the theory that visions inspired a belief that Jesus had been transported into the new heavenly body of the promised resurrection fits all nine facts better than any other theory. Now obviously we can construct some elaborate hypothesis to explain away all this evidence. But my explanation will still remain the simplest and thus the most probable, the one most loyal to what Paul himself says, and the one most consistent with known probabilities and all the actual facts of history. Thank you. So we proceed according to plan. Uh, now Mike Lacuna has 10 minutes uh, to respond to what he's just heard. Thank you, Richard, for that opening statement. 
Richard and I agreed to exchange our opening statements a few weeks ago in order to provide a more focused and interesting debate. Thus, we've had some time to prepare our first rebuttals. Let me recap my argument for Jesus' resurrection. I presented three historical facts that are strongly evidenced and widely accepted by the large majority of scholars. Jesus' death by crucifixion, the empty tomb, and the beliefs of a number of people, both friend and foe, that Jesus had been resurrected and had appeared to them. I provided evidence for all of these and argued that Jesus' resurrection is the best explanation for those facts because it accounts for all of the facts, does so easily and without strain. I also pointed out that when all natural theories fail or are less likely than the resurrection, we're justified in concluding that a miracle has occurred when the data appear in a context charged with religious significance. I further showed that such a context exists with Jesus' resurrection and therefore significantly increases the probability of a miracle. Now let's look at Richard's theory. He grants that Jesus died and that the disciples had genuine experiences that they interpreted as being the risen Jesus. However, he holds that these can be accounted for by hallucinations or dreams. He also holds that the empty tomb is the result of later legendary development. He then presented nine arguments to support it. Since I only have 10 minutes to reply, and since some of his arguments are repetitious, I'm going to categorize his nine objections into three areas and address these. First, the first category is his philosophical objections. His fourth and seventh objections are nearly identical and concern frequency, probability. He says myths, hallucinations, and dreams are more frequent than amazing but true stories or genuine supernatural encounters. Thus, he says, there's a greater probability that what we have here are myths, hallucinations, and dreams. But probabilities of this sort uh, only work when blind processes are involved. They don't work if there is intention behind it. For example, your chances of losing the lottery are much greater than your chances of winning. However, if I re rig the lottery so that your number will come up, your chances of winning become greater than your chances of losing. Thus, if a context exists where there's reason to believe God may want to act, the chances that we have a genuine miracle in our hands may be greater than they are for myth, dream, or hallucination, especially if other data point away from these, as they do. The prominent atheist philosopher Antony Flew comments, certainly, given some beliefs about God, the occurrence of the resurrection does become enormously more probable. His fifth argument is that the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is insufficient to overcome the low probability of a supernatural or amazing but true event. Not at all. We've already seen that frequency probability doesn't work when intentionality is present. Moreover, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is good, contrary to Richard's claim that it is of the worst sort. His comparison with Caesar's crossing the Rubicon is seriously flawed and downright inaccurate on many of the things he said. For example, he speaks of the credibility of the Roman historians over the Gospels. Yet, classical historian A. N. Sherwin White of Oxford writes that the Roman historians disagree amongst themselves in the wildest possible fashion, both in major matters and in specific details. Sherwin White adds that the Roman historians are no better than the Gospels. Now, I don't have time to address this further in this rebuttal, but I hope to bring it up in my next one. Richard says we need especially strong evidence to overcome low probability. I believe we have such evidence for Jesus' resurrection. But the requirement of especially strong evidence to overcome low probability cuts both ways. Remember, he proposed hallucinations or dreams. His theory requires group hallucinations, which most psychologists agree are impossible, and hallucinations experienced by his enemies who are unlikely to have been in the frame of mind to hallucinate. All of this makes his theory very improbable as well as ad hoc. Thus, by his own criteria, he's going to need extraordinary evidence to support his extraordinary claims. The second category involves his criticisms of the Gospels. His sixth and ninth arguments concern details in them. Now, I'd be happy to address these later, but because I'm pressed for time, for now I'll simply point out that this argument is entirely moot since virtually all of the evidence I provided is from Paul and the Kerygma, data that predate the Gospels by decades. The third category of his objections relate to Paul. His first, second, third, and eighth arguments have to do with Paul's interpretation of what happened to Jesus. He went to 1 Corinthians 15 and argued that Paul held that when Christians die, they exchange their old bodies for a new one, a spiritual one. On the other hand, I've proposed the orthodox view, which states that the body that is buried is the same body that will be raised and transformed into an immortal body. Did Paul support Richard's exchange theory? 
or the orthodox transformation view. Well, I'm going to go through the same passage quickly. We'll look carefully at the Greek and we'll see where Richard clearly misunderstands Paul at numerous and crucial points. In this passage, Paul is answering the question, what will our future bodies be like? He starts off by saying, so is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown, it is raised. When Paul says, so is the resurrection of the dead, the dead is in the plural in Greek. In other words, the dead ones are those who have died. But the very next term is in the singular. It is sown, it is raised. He's referring to our present, and, our present body and there's continuity. In other words, what goes down in burial comes up in resurrection. It's a transformation, not an exchange. Paul says, it is sown a natural body, and it is raised a spiritual body. Richard interprets the meaning of the Greek word for spiritual, pneumatikos, as something of a different substance, a heavenly substance. Would you like to know how many times this Greek word refers to the material makeup of something as Richard holds? Zero. With the lone possible exception of Ephesians 6.12, which isn't clear, it never appears in that sense, at least not in Paul or the New Testament. This is easily discovered or checked with the precision using a premier software program like BibleWorks. Now we're fortunate that Paul uses the same two words for natural and spiritual earlier in the same letter. In chapter 2, verse 14, he says, The natural man does not accept the things that come from God because they are spiritually discerned. Here Paul mentions the natural man or those governed by their fleshly and sinful desires with spiritual truths, holy, pure, and related to God. Thus later in chapter 15, Paul is saying that our current body is sown with all of its fleshly and sinful desires and raised with holy, pure, and desires centered on God. There's nothing here in support of an interpretation that refers to a different bodily makeup. Thus the exchange theory is not supported here either. In the next verse, Paul refers to Adam as a living soul and Jesus as a life-giving spirit. The words Paul used for soul and spirit are the roots for the same two words we just discussed. This rules out any hopes of interpreting Paul as suggesting a different material makeup of the body. Moreover, the word for life-giving, zoopoieo, is used by Paul in Romans 8.11 where he says, The spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life, zoopoieo, to your mortal bodies. Notice Paul says the life-giving spirit will give life to our mortal bodies. Since Paul uses the same Greek word on the same subject of our future bodies, it is clear that transformation is meant, not an exchange. Richard objects that in verse 50, Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And in doing so contradicts Luke, who has Jesus saying, a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. But here again, he has failed to grasp the linguistics of the passage. Greek exegete D.A. Carson notes that the term flesh and blood was a common Jewish expression referring to man as a mortal being. A Bible work search reveals that the term appears five times in the New Testament and twice in intertestamental writings, all with the meaning of being mortal. Thus Paul is not at all contradicting Luke. And once again, there is nothing here hinting at an exchange. Finally, Richard says that in um, verses 51 and 52, Paul uses the term um, oligosamatha, which does not mean change in the sense of changing one thing into another thing, I'm quoting him, but is instead the verb of mercantile exchange, of trading one thing for another. Folks, this is a half-truth and the wrong half. All anyone has to do is go to the major Greek lexicons such as Liddell Scott, BDAG, and Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, and you'll discover, contrary to Richard's claim, that the primary meaning of the term is to change, to alter. The mercantile definition of trading one thing for another is a secondary definition. In fact, BDAG and TDNT list 1 Corinthians 15 under the primary definition of altering. Liddell Scott is silent on the verse. In conclusion, we've seen that the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is very good, and Richard's arguments fail, leaving him without a perch on which to roost. His theory is far from being simple, omits important considerations in his philosophical arguments, contains numerous and major inaccuracies, strains the Greek in order to accommodate him, is ad hoc, and has less explanatory power than the theory that Jesus rose, and therefore should be rejected. Thank you. And now for Carrier's first rebuttal. Thank you.
I agree with Mike on two of his three facts. Probably Jesus died, and then probably his most ardent followers sincerely believed they had seen him. But I do not agree we have good evidence there was an empty tomb. First, Mike's Jerusalem factor carries no weight against my theory, since I have given you several good reasons to think the original Christians did not believe the tomb was empty, but that the corpse was empty of the spirit of Jesus which had poured itself into a completely new body in, he in heaven. The Jews or Romans could not respond to such a claim by pointing to the old body. Second, Mike is correct that most Jews only regarded as a resurrection a bodily event, but that is also irrelevant. Since I am arguing that it was indeed believed to be a bodily event, it just didn't involve the body and the tomb. And third, Mike is incorrect when he says that Jesus' enemies attest to the empty tomb. We do not have a single document by any enemy of Christianity uh, from the first century even alluding to an empty tomb. All we have is a claim by a single Christian, Matthew. And I'm pretty sure that Matthew made that up. I'll say more on these points presently. But first, I pause to address an issue I hadn't, didn't have time to explore in my opening, which is why Paul converted. As to the disciples and any family members who would be shattered by the terrible death of Jesus, I believe a series of grief-induced hallucinations strongly inspired by religious fervor, fatigue, stress, or fasting, and the contemplation of things Jesus said and the searching of hidden meanings in scripture to make some sense of the tragedy could all have conspired to produce an affirming experience of a vindicated Jesus. There is nothing peculiar in such events involving groups. Several cases have been documented. Suggestion and memory contamination are well understood. Though all may have been seeing something different, all would believe they were seeing the same thing, only in their own way, especially if there was a strong leader guiding them in their interpretation of what was happening. I could say a lot more about this, but my time is short. The main question is why Paul would have such an experience, since he was not inspired by grief at the death of Jesus. First, I should point out that this is exactly why Paul is unique, because his inspiring circumstances were unique. If God were really appearing to people, there is hardly any credible reason why he would appear to only to one persecutor rather than to all of them, or at least a lot of them. But if Paul's experience were natural rather than divine, then we should expect such an event to be rare, possibly even unique, and lo and behold, that appears to be the case. This point carries for the disciples, too. It is extremely improbable that a genuinely divine Jesus would appear to only a few people in only one tiny place and only one brief time. It is far more probable he would have appeared to everyone at all times, or at the very least, everyone who could be saved. That the religion began with private visions granted only to a privileged few in a time and culture where this was common is more consistent with it beginning like every other visionary religion, as a natural product of human culture, psychology, and physiology. As to what actually happened to Paul, we know very little, which leaves a lot of room for speculation. I believe Paul came to feel guilt at what he was doing to the Christians, which became all the more painful to him when he started to find the Christian teaching appealing, especially its social program of moral reform. I argue in a forthcoming article of the Journal of Higher Criticism why this program was very appealing, even to outsiders like Paul. But to join this movement for a better society, Paul had to convert. The stress from worrying how to rationalize joining this program, and from his guilt at having treated so horribly those with such noble intentions, and the ensuing fatigue of losing sleep over this and traveling on a long, desolate road, could easily have conspired, in his case, to induce an affirming hallucination, his subconscious mind producing for him the very thing he most wanted, a sincere motive to repent and become a leader rather than a persecutor of the movement he'd come to admire. So I see no difficulty in appealing to ordinary religious hallucination. My theory agrees with what we know about the neurophysics, the psychology, and the anthropology of religious experience throughout the world, and it does not contradict anything we read from Paul himself. That said, I'd like to return to the two points I made earlier. First, Josephus, who, like Paul, was a Pharisee, wrote that, the bodies of all men are truly mortal. They are created out of corruptible matter. But the soul is forever immortal and is a part of God that inhabits our bodies. When people exit this life, then the souls that remain pure and obedient obtain from God the holiest place in heaven. And from there, after the completion of the ages, once again they are sent instead into pristine bodies. Elsewhere, Josephus says, God has granted that we be recreated and get a better life after the revolution. And in another passage, he explains, 
the Pharisees say that though every soul is incorruptible, only the soul of good men crosses over into another body. There can be no mistaking what Josephus is saying. We will get completely new bodies in the resurrection, for our present bodies can do nothing but return to dust. The doctrine of Philo and the Essene Jews was more complicated, but it amounts to nearly the same view. And Paul uses the same kind of language as they do, not only in 1 Corinthians 15, but elsewhere. In Philippians, for example, Paul does not say our bodies will change. He says God will change the form of our bodies to share the same form of Christ's body. And he uses the same word Josephus sometimes uses to refer to changing clothes. And in the same passage, Paul says our place of citizenship exists in the heavens, while our present body, our present body belongs to a lowly state. The exact same ideas are found in Philo and the Essenes. Then, in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed. Because the things that can be seen are temporary, it's the things that can't be seen that are eternal. So Paul says the body we see is not eternal, only the spiritual body, which we can't yet see, is eternal. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, We know that if our earthly house of a body is torn down, we have a building from God, a house made without hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in our present body, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. And if we do get undressed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in the body, we groan because we are weighed down. And for this reason, we do not want to undress, but to put something on, so what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. This is quite explicit. Our earthly body will be torn down and taken away, and we will be given a new heavenly body. And everything Paul says here is almost exactly what, the, what Philo and the Essenes say. The clincher is this. Mike cites N.T. Wright's monumental treatise on this subject, but evidently Mike didn't read it. I quote from that very book. Wright says, It is no doubt right that Paul can envisage here the possibility of exchange, losing one body, getting another one, rather than addition. Two of the greatest Christian scholars in antiquity agreed, Origen and John Philippon. Today, several experts share this view. C.F.C. Moule, Gregory Riley, Dale Martin, Adela Collins, Peter Lamp. So my theory is more than plausible. Then there is the accusation of theft. Peculiar verbal and structural clues in Matthew's narrative prove that Matthew transformed Mark's narrative into a new version of the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Making that parallel fit required the placing of a seal on the tomb to match the placing of a seal on Daniel's den. And the placing of a seal required the placing of guards, and the placing of guards requires an accusation of theft. We can know this is all fiction because none of the other gospel accounts of the empty tomb make the presence of guards at all possible. And no other document independent of Matthew ever mentions the claim. Not even Acts, despite the fact it depicts numerous Jewish attacks against the nascent church, so it is most peculiar that Luke had never heard of their accusation of theft. Most peculiar of all, in actual Jewish documents, only the legitimacy of Jesus is challenged. The most biting Jewish polemic in the Talmud hugely contradicts the gospel accounts of the trial of Jesus, and yet still they saw no need to counter the claim of an empty tomb. That's just bizarre, unless there was no such claim to counter. We might also add that in Jewish legend, the Roman general Titus cast a necromantic spell to summon the spirit of Jesus for questioning. We happen to know such a spell required the skull of the deceased, which entails the Jews believed, at least, the skull of Jesus was available, which suggests they did not believe the tomb was empty. Finally, I believe Mark invented the empty tomb story as a symbolic parable and not a claim to historical fact. Mark says Jesus declare, declared, I will destroy this holy residence made by hands and in three days build another house not made by hands, clearly referring to his resurrection. Yet he says he will not raise the same body, but build a new one, not made by hands, exactly as Paul said. So Mark doesn't really believe the tomb was empty. He only uses it as a metaphor. I have several good reasons for believing this, which unfortunately I haven't time to ex explain right now. But many of Mike's objections, such as why Mark has women finding the tomb instead of men, uh, are required by Mark's mythic structure. For example, it fulfills the prediction of Jesus that the least shall be first. Thank you. Once again, uh, Michael Connor.
Thanks. In Richard's first rebuttal, he said that he agreed with that Jesus died and that his believers uh, were convinced that they saw him. He attacked, but he doesn't believe in the empty tomb. He says the Jerusalem factor that I uh, presented carries no weight because he showed that the Jews didn't believe resurrection. Well, I, I don't think he did that. Um, he tried to show that Paul didn't believe in resurrection, but we showed that he was flawed in the way he said that because of his misunderstanding of the Greek and, and Paul at very specific and crucial points. Well, he says um, uh, uh, that uh, there were no enemy documents to the empty tomb, and thus we couldn't use enemy attested. Well, uh, he says that, uh, in fact, he thinks it's only in Matthew and that Matthew made it up. Well, I'd like to know where his evidence is for that. He didn't provide any. He just made an unsupported, unsubstantiated claim. Sure, he just made it up. Let's not provide any evidence. Then he said, well, the disciples um, um, uh, experienced grief hallucination. Well, this doesn't account for the empty tomb, which I said I think is strongly supported, and it is largely acknowledged by scholarship today, an impressive 75%. If they were experiencing grief hallucinations, it wouldn't account for the appearances to the skeptic James, who wouldn't have been grieving, and it wouldn't account to the, um, for Paul, who wouldn't have been grieving either. Well, he said, yeah, but Paul uh, was guilty. He felt guilty about what he was doing. Well, there's no evidence for that either. In fact, Paul seemed to be proud of his resume that's presented in Philippians chapter 2, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, he said. Well, then he says, well, it's, it's improbable that Jesus appeared to only a few. Well, how does he know that? Well, what kind of probability calculus is he basing that theory upon? Um, how does he know why Jesus would only appear to that? The fact is that Jesus appeared to people, uh, at least uh, people who were his followers did, a number of them did, to both individuals and groups, and he appeared to one enemy, at least, and probably even a skeptic. Well, then he mentions... Um, um, Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.14, and he said uh, that Paul had this exchange in mind, and he said, well, I probably didn't even read N.T. Wright's book. Well, I did, and, and I would encourage Richard to go back to that passage because um, N.T. Wright in that very passage says it's very tough, and, and scholars disagree almost down the line, 50-50, on what Paul is, is really saying here. And he quotes Martin Hengel, if I recall properly. It's been about a, uh, six, seven, nine months since I've, or July, last July since I read the book. But um, he, I think he quotes Martin Hengel as saying it's just really difficult and scholars really disagree on this passage and what it's really saying. But he goes on to say that Paul had, we need not think that Paul was referring to the spiritual body, and here's why. We showed very definitely that Paul was referring to a bodily resurrection, a transformation, not an exchange, in 1 Corinthians 15. Even if Richard was right here in his interpretation that he's, not, that he's talking more of an ethereal body in 2 Corinthians, just one year later, Paul writes Romans, which he's very specifically in Romans 8.11, talks about bodily resurrection of the same body. Remember, the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life, zoio poieo, to your mortal bodies. There's no question that transformation is what is being referred to here. Well, he quotes uh, Josephus there. Yeah, I admit that Josephus, this passage is tough, but he doesn't say resurrection here either. He's just saying that this was his view of what happened in the afterlife. Now, I contacted Lewis Feldman on this. Lewis Feldman is perhaps the greatest uh, living Josephus scholar today, and he's a Jewish scholar. And Joseph, um, Feldman wrote me back and, and said that, and I quote, this passage does not seem to me to talk about, I'm sorry, this passage does seem to me to talk about reincarnation in a new body. Though he deals with Daniel at length, he does not refer to Daniel 12, 1 through 3, which speaks of resurrection. I wonder about this because in Life 12, he identifies politically with the Pharisees, who certainly in the Talmud, Mishnah Sanhedrin 10, 1, regard the belief in resurrection as a cornerstone of Judaism. Perhaps he believed in both reincarnation and resurrection. Besides, the whole thing is moot what Josephus and Philo and the Essenes believed. We know that the Jews had a number of different beliefs regarding the afterlife. I pointed that out in my opening statement. Remember the Sadducees. They didn't believe in resurrection at all. They just believed that when you died, that was it. The question is, what did the earliest Christians believe? And we see very clearly from the earliest Christian writer, Paul, that they believed in resurrection of the same body. It was a transformation. This is further confirmed in the very passage which Richard quoted from Paul, Philippians 3.21, where it says, um, 
we eagerly wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform. The word transform is used there. It's not a changing of clothes. It's a transformation. Um, who will transform. What's he going to transform? Our lowly, humble bodies into conformity with his glorious body. Again, it's not an exchange. It's a transformation. Well, then he talked about, he said, uh, the guards. He says, well, I, I don't think that this is authentic. Well, there are some good arguments that for a Jewish polemic here, Jewish Christian polemic that says, um, Jesus rose from the dead, Jewish response. No, the disciples stole the body, Christian response. Uh, they couldn't have because the guards at the tomb, Jewish response. No, the guards fell asleep, Christian response. No, the chief priest paid them to say that. And so when you look at this, we can see that perhaps there is some good evidence for the guards there. Besides, my, my um, uh, argument didn't rest on the guards anyway. He said, well, the Talmud contradicts the Gospels on Jesus. Well, the Talmud is late. It's hundreds of years after Jesus. And most believe, uh, even Jewish historians, that we, we, this is just a polemic against the Christians of those days. It's not trying to accurately report the historical Jesus. Well, he says, Mark invented the empty tomb as a parallel, and it's not a historical fact at all. Well, I believe he's taking this because from Dennis MacDonald in his book, The Homeric Ep Epics in the Gospel of Mark, which he writes on and endorses online. But this view is both irrelevant and wrong. It's irrelevant because Mark is decades later than the oral tradition in Paul that I quoted, which comes decades before. It's wrong because many times MacDonald has to strain and contort the text to find his parallels, especially when he comes to the death, burial, and resurrection. For example, in the Iliad, Hector's body is burned and his tomb holds his remains forever, while Jesus' body is resurrected three days later. Resurrection is mentioned three times in the Iliad, twice regarding its impossibility and once in the metaphor of Hector's avoidance of certain death. Mark differs in a million ways from Homer. In fact, in order to account for this, MacDonald claims that Mark, and I quote, Mark hid his dependence by avoiding Homeric vocabulary, transforming characterizations, motifs, and episodes, placing the episodes out of sequence, and employing multiple literary models, especially from Jewish scriptures, end quote, page 170. In other words, MacDonald is claiming that all of the characteristics the historian would look for in order to show a borrowing are absent because Mark changed everything intentionally in order to keep from being detected. Well, using this kind of answer, um, we might accuse any author of copying from any other author of our choice. Are we surprised to find then that MacDonald's thesis has not gained much of a following? In fact, the um, Robert Rabble, the professor of Greek and Roman history uh, literature at the University of Kentucky comments that one can discern literally hundreds of close parallels between the Iliad and, say, Clint Eastwood's movie, Unforgiven. So we've seen that these failed. I got two minutes left. Let me uh, see if I can touch on this Rubicon comparison real quickly, and I'll take the more important points. He says that we have direct physical evidence for Caesar's crossing the Rubicon, such as inscriptions and coins. Yet he says there's nothing of the sort for Jesus' resurrection. Well, we have an empty tomb. We have documents written by even enemies. Well, coins would be nice, but since the Roman Empire was killing Christians at that time, I don't think we can expect a commemorative coin sept in, uh, in honor of Jesus. Moreover, if he rose from the dead, we wouldn't find bones or a bone box. I don't know what else he wants, a photo? Well, if the Shroud of Turin is authentic, we have that too. He says, Caesar, we have unbiased corroboration, since even his enemies, Cicero, reported the event. Well, we have two enemies, Paul and James, who reported a post-mortem appearance of Jesus to them. And Paul was certainly more hostile toward Christians than Cicero was to Caesar. Well, he mentions bias. Well, bias doesn't mean false information. In one of his articles, Richard refers to religion as socially acceptable insanity. That's clear bias against religion. Should we therefore reject everything he's saying here this evening? I don't think so. We simply need to be aware of the bias of the writer and for our own for that part, and then proceed with caution. He says that several credible accounts of the Rubicon event by known scholars of the time, whereas no one historian reports the resurrection of Jesus. First, Richard underestimates the reliability of the Gospels. The historical accuracy of Luke and John have many times been corroborated by archeological finds. He also overestimates the greatness of the Roman historians he cites. 
For example, Suetonius is indiscriminate in his use of sources. Plutarch is inaccurate at times and makes frequent use of anecdotal material, such as when he said that, said that Alexander the Great descended from Hercules. Appian is known for his many inaccuracies. Cassius Dio contradicts himself as well as embellishes changes and combines facts in order to be more dramatic. Pliny the Younger, just a few um, pages after one of the works that uh, Richard quotes, mentions dog-headed apes, uh, five-year-old girls who give uh, birth, a woman who gave birth to an elephant, 12 uh, feet tall Ethiopians. These are the sources he's appealing to and say they're very credible over the Gospels. Moreover, all the Roman historians write 150 to 250 years after Caesar's crossing the Rubicon, whereas the reports of Jesus' resurrection start within five years of the event. Even the Gospels by critical dating are only 40 to 70 years later. So I don't think that we have some problems here with the Gospels. I think we still have good re reason to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, just as we find in the earliest multiple enemy and embarrassing sources. Thank you. Okay, it's time to go to the show. Here you go. Ten minutes now. Slide 23, please. I argued that Mark invented the empty tomb story as a symbolic parable, not a claim to historical fact. Um, I, there are six pieces of evidence for this conclusion, and I think it's important to go over them because they support the overall point that I've been making, that Mark is not writing history, so we cannot compare him in the same genre as historical sources. First, Mark's gospel is structured throughout with a the constant theme of reversal of expectation. For example, Mark has Jesus tell Simon Peter to deny himself and take up his cross and follow. So we expect Simon Peter to carry Christ's cross. But Mark thwarts our expectations by having a completely different man named Simon carry Christ's cross, a stranger from Cyrene on the opposite side of Egypt, a symbol of death in Jewish lore. There are dozens of other examples like that. So Mark has to make the tomb empty to thwart our expectations, just as he has to defy our expectations by having women find the tomb instead of men to prove the words of Jesus that the least shall be first. Now, I'm going to go over these others as I go. Uh, Mike was debating against Dennis McDonald's theory. I don't know why. I never brought it up. Uh, I don't necessarily support it. Uh, these, these, four, these facts here are not in McDonald. These are completely separate facts. So rebutting McDonald doesn't have any effect on what I'm talking about. Um, now, and also I should bring up the fact that he mentioned the inaccuracies and uh, the unreliability of ancient historians. I agree with him, actually. Ancient historians are much worse than modern historians. But giving reasons we don't have evidence and showing that the, all the other sources of the ancient world were unreliable doesn't really rebut the fact that the sources are unreliable and we don't have good evidence. Uh, this is very important. But I'm going to go back to my list. Second, Mark's empty tomb narrative contains six linguistic and conceptual markers taken straight out of a popular competitor to Christianity, the Orphic Mysteries, which also taught salvation through a baptism that washes away sin. Six markers in one place is too improbable to be a coincidence. One of the principal doctrines of Orphism was that our body was a tomb for the soul. Thus, it seems apparent that Mark is using the empty tomb to symbolize the empty body of Christ. And as I quoted earlier, Mark says that Jesus said that he would destroy the current body and build a completely new body, another body, not made by hands. So Mark's uh, whole theme supports this. Third, Paul's entire passion, uh, Mark's entire passion narrative mimics the Messianic Psalms. Slide 27, please. His crucifixion narrative borrows five elements from Psalm 22, often quoting verbatim. Psalm 23 is the famous funeral psalm, representing Christ's Sabbath day's sojourn in the valley of the shadow of death. And Psalm 24 celebrates the triumph of the Messiah over death on the first day of the week. The fact that Mark uses the exact same phrase on the first day of the week to introduce his empty tomb narrative demonstrates he is interpreting that psalm. Uh, it, the whole thing represents the gates of death opening and the Lord ascending to heaven, as it says in that psalm. So the empty tomb symbolizes Christ's ascension and escape from death. Back to slide 23, please. Fourth, Mark has the women ask, who will roll away the stone, using a phrase copied nearly verbatim from the Genesis narrative of Jacob's fathering of the twelve tribes of Israel. In that story, a woman brings the sheep to be watered at Jacob's well. So Christ's tomb is a symbol of that well, whose opening also brings the water of life to the sheep of a new Israel. 
Fifth, Mark uses still more phrases borrowed from Ecclesiastes and Chronicles depicting Jesus as the new King Asa, a famous reformer of Judaism. And sixth, we know Mark believed in the two-body resurrection doctrine because he says, as I said, that he would make another house not made by hands. That's that particular issue. He also brought up uh, Romans 8.11 uh, that he says that Paul claims God will raise our present bodies, but Paul is not talking about resurrection in that passage. He does not say God will raise our mortal bodies, nor does he say he will change our mortal bodies into immortal ones. Rather, the context of that verse, slide 62, please, context of verses 1 through 10 established that Paul is talking about our lives in the here and now. He uses exactly the same language in Ephesians and Colossians when discussing our present experience of the kingdom, not our future resurrection. Paul says in all three places that we are made alive already because our bodies are already dead. Instead, Paul is otherwise quite explicit that our current bodies will be destroyed, not transformed. Slide 65, please. Besides the many passages I have already read to you, in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says point blank that our flesh must be destroyed so our spirits can be saved. In Romans 7, Paul says he longs to be liberated from the flesh. In Colossians, Paul says our present bodies are the body parts we have on earth. In contrast, the lives will live with God. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says we now live in clay pots, using the technical term in Jewish law for pots that, once used, must be destroyed. The Bible calls these pots made by hands, in contrast with gold pots which are superior and not made by hands. As I have already noted, both Paul and Mark call our resurrection body a body not made by hands. The evidence is overwhelming. Paul did not believe we would rise in our bodies of flesh. He clearly believed the flesh would be destroyed and we would get new, better bodies in the resurrection. Now, I'd like to bring up another point. Uh, I can't possibly cover every issue, unfortunately, in the limited time. Uh, but uh, Mike says that we can infer a miracle in a situation when the intention is present, but that's a circular argument. It's precisely the issue to be proved whether there was a God who had the intention to raise Jesus. There's no evidence of the supernatural to support this, to give it, underground, uh, to give it a grounding, uh, versus plenty of very good evidence uh, for hallucination and legendary development. Slide 77, please. This is basically how it breaks down. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. For example, I own a car means we have tons of evidence already because most people own a car, therefore minimal evidence is needed for Proposition 1. But I own a nuclear missile, well there's not very much evidence there because few people own a nuclear missile, so a lot more evidence is needed for 2, the kind of evidence that would convince the CIA. Now, if I said I own an interstellar spacecraft, there's no evidence that such a thing even exists, so even much more evidence is needed for three, the sort that would convince the entire United Nations. Now, uh, this, this resurrection, the God appearing to people, is the same category as category three. We have never seen any scientific proof, any more scientific proof that uh, God has actually appeared to people or that actually resurrects bodies than we have seen that there are interstellar spacecraft flying around. So that's what I'm talking about when I say we need really good evidence, but we don't have that kind of good evidence. Now, he also mentioned alagesamatha in the lexicon saying that it means change, but that's the colloquial sense, like change clothes. Every single use of this word in the New Testament and the Septuagint means trade. For example, exchanging gods or exchanging customs or exchanging clothes. And to make this even clearer, and this makes the point even better, slide 66, please. Paul, is, Paul gets his word from a passage in the Psalms, the same passage that's used by Hebrews, uh, which is also in the New Testament. It says, both passages, that the world will be destroyed. I want to make that point clear. Destroyed and replaced. And it says the old one will wear out and be rolled up like a garment and traded in. Traded in. Alagesamatha, in this case alagesantai, the third person, but nevertheless, the exact same word, the exact same form, as Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15 of what happens to our bodies. Paul also refers to our bodies as garments, something we wear. And Mark uses garments as a symbol of body. Uh, with the uh, young man who becomes naked in his narrative, that symbolizes losing the body of flesh. And the young man with the white robe represents getting the new resurrection body. Now, the fact that Paul t gets this word from a passage that clearly talks about the universe being destroyed and being replaced uh, supports my 
position here. And also the fact that every single use in the New Testament in the Septuagint is about trade is exactly why I come to the conclusion that Paul chose this word very carefully. And he never does say, change the body. When, even when in Philippians, he says that he will change the form of our body to conform to the form of the body of Christ. And the word he uses, metaschematizdo, as I said, is the same word used by Josephus for changing clothes. And we know that Paul, again, thinks of these bodies as two kinds of clothes that we swap in and out of. Now, he, uh, Mike also mentioned that scholars disagree about the meaning of this passage 50-50. Well, okay, that means Mike can't, prove I'm can't claim to prove I'm wrong, so we can't be sure he's right either. Uh, I personally think the evidence is much stronger than that, but if it's 50-50, that's not a very good case. Um, now, he also says that 75% of scholars believe in an empty tomb. Well, that's not good enough either. 95% is your standard for a consensus. That means there's 25% of bona fide scholars out there, and I named several bona fide scholars, ancient and modern, who agreed uh, in the same theory that the body is a, it's a situation of body exchange, not body change. Uh, Mike also mentioned uh, that the spiritual body is sown. He said, it will be sown. Well, the word it is not in the Greek. The subject of the sentence is body, which is repeated twice. Thus, two bodies are meant. He also mentions flesh and blood. Slide 68, please. The only reason this phrase can mean mortal is that flesh and blood is mortal. That is precisely Paul's point. He says in the same sentence that decay cannot receive indestructibility. So he means mortal things like flesh and blood cannot receive immortality. That's the only sense and that's the only reason why it would carry that same meaning. He also mentions pneumaticos. Slide 69, please. We have time? Okay, sorry. Don't have time to continue with that. Thank you. Okay, as you can see, this is a subject that has many, many, many aspects, and, and many of them will not be able to be discussed tonight. But now in the next five minutes, each one will have the opportunity to uh, wrap up what they're going to do. Have you decided? Are you, is, uh, who's going first? You, want, you just want to stay there and do it? Yeah, you ready? go right ahead. Mm -hmm. You ready to go? Ready to go? Yeah, All right, let's go. here you go. Five minutes. Slide 20, please. Okay, I've said there are many plausible theories contrary to what Mike has argued tonight, and I only had time to argue the case for one of them, and I didn't even get the chance to argue it completely. I wasn't able to rebut every single argument he brought up, but I could, and hopefully they'll come up in questions. The one I personally think is the most probable is this. Following what we know to be the ordinary course of religious experience and development throughout human cultures, the disciples dreamed or hallucinated a bodily encounter with Jesus and concluded he had been granted the new body of the resurrection, which all would share if they attached themselves to him. Originally, it was thought that he left the old body behind, but then the church fragmented into different beliefs and came up with the body of flesh idea, which we see in Luke. I've brought up 10 facts that support this theory. One, Paul, our earliest and best source, uh, talks about a spiritual resurrection. It's not about, he's not saying uh, desires. Desires is not an issue in there. He's all talking about bodies, different bodies, bodies in heaven, bodies on earth, different kinds of flesh, flesh of fish, flesh of humans. So when he finally comes to talking about bodies, he's clearly not talking about desires. He's talking about substance. He says the man is made of earth from heaven, or made of dust from the earth, and the other man is made from heaven, or comes from heaven. So clearly the context is about different bodies, different substances. And in, with any kind of Greek word, you have to look to the context. In this particular passage, the context is different bodies. And Paul says, point blank, that the body that dies is not, uh, the body that is sown is, that dies is not the body that rises. <clears throat> Paul omits all the crucial claims of Luke and John that are the only evidence on record that Jesus rose in the flesh. Paul describes the resurrection in terms of exchanging one body for another, as I talked about. The body that d dies is not the body that will rise. He says that. And the language he uses is exactly the same kind of language as Josephus, Philo, and the Essenes of different switching, switching different bodies, of corruptible substances versus indestructible substances. Fourth, we know that the frequency of amazing but true stories is very low, and that the frequency of myths and legends is very high. Uh, we don't have an adequate enough evidence to prove that the empty tomb is not a legend. Uh, even uh, Mike agrees that the ancient sources are so unreliable that we can't really trust them. And the Gospels are no better, certainly. Uh, 
five, uh, extraordinary evidence would be needed. Uh, he gives excuses for why we don't have the evidence, but that still means uh, we don't have the evidence. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what reason we don't have enough evidence to believe. If we don't have enough evidence to believe, that's it. We don't have enough evidence to believe, even if we have excuses for why we don't have that evidence. Six, the Gospels themselves show signs of an increasing rate of legendary development. They get more fabulous and polemical over time. The whole flesh polemic appears in Luke, uh, but Luke gets his original basic story from Mark, which doesn't contain that polemic. And as we saw, Mark tended to look at a two-body view of the resurrection. Seven, we know genuine supernatural encounters must be extraordinarily rare. Uh, once again, the whole point is we've never seen an example of this. We've never proven that there's anything supernatural. Even if there is a God, we have not proven that he intervenes in the course of events, that he appears to people, for example. Yet we have tons and tons of evidence of false appearances of God, of hallucinations, dreams, and so forth, from many different religions and cultures. So any particular claim where we see that there's some sort of visionary experience, such as Paul describes, the probability already is greater that it is a natural event and not a supernatural event. We have, it's like finding that there's a supernatural international spacecraft, uh, I'm sorry, interstellar spacecraft. The odds of that are just too low. And we, don't, we would need really good evidence to overcome this, and we don't have that evidence. Eight, Paul, our best source, describes Jesus in terms more consistent with a vision than a real physical encounter. And he never identifies any difference in nature between his experience and the disciples. His vision was a revelation of Christ. Nine, Mark and Matthew don't mention Jesus being touched or eating food or whooshing up into heaven before gawking crowds or outright saying he wasn't a spirit. Only the later sources of Luke and John contain such details. Paul, of course, never mentions the empty tomb, never mentions any of the details regarding flesh, and yet we would expect him to when he's talking about the nature, the nature of the resurrection body. And also the several gospels share the detail that Jesus suddenly appeared and disappeared and sometimes wasn't recognized, more consistent with visions than a physical body. All nine of those facts are more probable if my theory is true and less probable if Mike's theory is true. Therefore, my theory is the best explanation of the facts we have. And there is a tenth fact. As I said, a real God would not have Jesus appear to only a select few in one tiny locale. That Christianity would begin in such a way is more probable if it began the way all religions do, with natural visions interpreted in a convenient way, and less probable if it began with a genuine act of God. Uh, and this I can emphasize as my final point. Uh, if God really loved us and really wanted to save us all, he obviously, I know I would appear to all of you. I would come to all of you and explain the situation, and lay the cards on the table. I wouldn't uh, just appear to a few people, maybe a few hundred people at most, in the ancient world 2,000 years ago and then stop. And then rely on those guys to come out and tell people, uh, look, look, I saw God. Well, you're not going to see him, but I saw him. And listen to what I have to say. Um, I find that highly improbable. A loving God, uh, especially... Uh, a God who was compassionate as, as compassionate as I am would certainly appear to everyone at all times. He wouldn't rely on a human mission. Okay. Is that it? Thank yep, you. Yep, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now for Mike Lacona's uh, wrap up. I'd again like to thank Veritas Forum here at UCLA for inviting me to take part in tonight's debate. I'd also like to thank Richard for an enjoyable exchange. Well, many of you came this evening hoping to see the Christian get his butt kicked, or you came hoping to see the skeptic get his butt kicked. Well, for the skeptics here this evening, you've had a noble and skilled representative of your view. How will you answer the question, did Jesus rise from the dead? The eminent New Testament historian N.T. Wright comments, what we are after is high probability, and this is to be attained by examining all the possibilities, all the suggestions, and asking how well they explain the phenomena. In light of this, let's look at now at our two theories this evening. The Christian theory that Jesus was resurrected certainly explains all of the evidence very well and without strain. It easily explains Jesus' death by crucifixion. It easily explains the empty tomb. Even though Richard believes the empty tomb is a legend, we've seen that there's good evidence for it, and a majority of scholars, a large majority, are convinced by this evidence. It easily explains the subsequent events or beliefs of many, friend and foe alike, that the um, resurrected Jesus had appeared to them. It easily explains um, the spread of, of the church, despite the fact that its leader had been killed. Moreover, all natural explanations posited fail or are highly unlikely. I'd like to add that the evidence I provided is based on early testimony, eyewitness testimony, enemy testimony, embarrassing testimony, and multiple testimonians. 
Historians consider this type of evidence very strong. Now let's look at Richard's hallucination legend hypothesis. There's no direct evidence in support of it. It's not the simplest theory. It contains numerous historiographical and linguistic inaccuracies, as we observed in his uh, comparison with Caesar's crossing the Rubicon and his treatment of 1 Corinthians 15. Nothing destroys an otherwise interesting argument like the facts. He has to strain the Greek in order to accommodate his theory by requiring a secondary definition against the majority of major lexicons. I mean, he pulled it up and he looked at Hebrews. Well, sure, I don't deny that that means, alagisamatha, means exchange elsewhere. The question is, what did Paul mean by it? And we see by the rest of his writings, he didn't mean exchange, he meant transformation. So adopting a secondary ex, uh, definition is meaningless. Now, in order to, let's see, um, in order to obtain data, he has to strain the gospel text, such as interpreting Luke and John as promoting a vision Jesus immediately after they discussed an empty tomb. It's ad hoc. That is, it includes assumptions about the past that aren't supported by our present understanding of reality. Remember, he said about the hallucinations, he says, okay, well, they're not group hallucinations, but what probably happened here is they all hallucinated the same thing simultaneously. So they were all in the frame of mind to hallucinate, and then they whereas only 8% have auditory and visual hallucinations simultaneously. Not only did just one of them have that, although it's only 8% of the cases, but they all had it simultaneously. I think that's quite straining at the text. He goes by Mark, and in his closing statement said a lot about Mark said this and this and legendary. Listen, I disagree with it, and he does endorse uh, McDonald's writings uh, book in his writings. You can check it out online. Um, but it's a moot point anyway. The evidence that I quoted and cited for Jesus' resurrection predates Mark by decades. So even if I'm wrong and Mark contains legendary developments, it's irrelevant. The stuff I uh, quoted is decades earlier. He says 2 Corinthians 5, 50-50 chance, so I can't base my belief in resurrection on it. I wasn't. He was. He quoted that in support of his view. So it's necessary for his uh, position. He presented it. His view omits important considerations such as intentionality and philosophical arguments against Jesus' resurrection. Um, he talked about the spacecraft as being equivalent. I don't think it's the same. There's no evidence for aliens, but there is scientific evidence for the existence of God. Folks, I don't have to do any of this kind of strain with the orthodox view of Jesus' resurrection. As N.T. Wright would say, um, Richard is building castles in the air, so it shouldn't be surprising when many of us don't want, feel obligated to rent a room. Given the strong evidence we have, when we add that Jesus' resurrection is the only plausible explanation that can account for it, and the evidence occurs in a context charged with religious significance, we can have a high degree of confidence that this event occurred. I close with this thought. In Mel Gibson's recent movie, The Passion, the most touching scene for me was when Jesus stumbled with the cross and his mother ran up to him and said, I'm here. And he responded and said, woman, I am making all things new. And he picked up the cross, and at that point, he looked straight forward with a look of great um, focus and started moving forward in pain. And it reminded me of Hebrews 12, too, that says, Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame. And I think about that, and I say, wow, it was his joy to restore our relationship and make it possible for us to have an intimate relationship with God that he thought little of the shame. Blessed be his holy and wonderful name. That's it. Good, thank you. Welcome back to the uh, final part of our evening together, uh, which will be conducted uh, via questions and answers from our, from our speakers. And I've been invited to ask the first questions and then to select among the questions that uh, have been submitted. There are way more than can be answered tonight. And some of the questions address issues that are not on the agenda for tonight, even though they're very important with respect to the later effect of Christian belief in history or the larger question of the relationship <coughs> of um, the science and religion. Uh, perhaps I should uh, address my first uh, question uh, to Mike uh, Lacona. Um, and I'll put two or three things together and you can pick up the part of it that you want to deal with. Uh, first of all, I think it would be helpful if you would uh, help us understand from your perspective uh, 
what it is about the traditions uh, that God raised Jesus from the dead uh, that makes it any different from the raising of Lazarus or the, the son of the widow of Nain. Um, and related to that, I suppose, could be the question, why is it important uh, for Jesus to have been raised by the God of Israel? That is to say, who was this Jesus uh, to those who encountered him uh, in the flesh? Um, that's probably enough. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Those are good questions. Um, regarding the tradition that um, Jesus, uh, God raised Jesus compared to Jesus raising Lazarus and the widow's son, I'd say the main difference is um, the widow's son and Lazarus wouldn't be considered resurrection. Um, the term anastasis, Greek term anastasis, is not used there. These would be what theologians would refer to as resuscitations. And you say, well, Mike, that's splitting hairs. They both came back to life. Or all, you know, Jesus, uh, the Gospels say, Jesus came back to life bodily, Lazarus bodily, the widow's son bodily. Come on, you're splitting hairs there. But this was the difference in the, in the Jewish concept there between the two. And if we didn't make such distinctions, well, then we'd have to say, well, you know, draw parallels and say, well, every time you have um, a claim for a ghost appearance today, then that would be resurrection as well. And so we have to draw these uh, distinctions. Regarding why Jesus' resurrection is so important is because um, Jesus himself listed it as the um, truth test by which we could know he was who he claimed to be. We have different, uh, different claims uh, predicting his death and resurrection, and um, they, they come in, they're multiply attested, and they come in different ways. And so uh, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then that makes him a false prophet whom no rational person should follow. But if he did raise from the dead, then it seems he did so in confirmation of his personal and radical claims. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, where to go with this? Um, does, and I, I, I don't mean this to be, first of all, polemical, but uh, in, the, in the earliest Christian writings, uh, a great deal of the tension. Excuse me, would I, would I be able huh? to add to anything to this? Uh, yeah, if you want to, sure, jump in. Yeah. Uh, would it be possible for me to get up a slide? If <clears throat> Slide 67, please. Now, uh, there's a problem here. Mike, Mike says that there's a difference between resuscitation and resurrection. Well, maybe in concept from what you see in Paul, but there's no verbal or linguistic difference. Uh, for example, uh, it, Paul uses actually unusual words for resurrection. He uses words... Uh, like uh, for rising up from sleep, anastasis and agero, which can mean just getting up in any sense. Uh, whereas there were better words to use, palingenesis, back to life, that's used by Plutarch, Matthew, Philo, some Jewish apocrypha, anabiosis, return to life, Plato, Plutarch, Diogenes, Laertius, talking about the Persian doctrine of resurrection and two Maccabees. There's no terminological distinction between resurrection and resuscitation. The same words are used in Lucian, Hebrews 11.35, Mark 5.42, 6.14 to 16, Matthew 9.25, Luke 8.55, 9.7 to 8, Acts 14.19 to 20. Uh, the resurrection of Jairus' daughter is aniste. It's uh, using the exact same word. So in the Bible, there's no actual uh, vocabulary difference between resusc resuscitation and resurrection. Uh, but Mike is correct in the one sense that uh, certainly Paul believed that after the resurrection you would be indestructible and glorious and made of a different substance. That's exactly my point. Uh, the body is different, and that's how Paul makes the distinction. But the distinction is conceptual. It's not verbal. And uh, from the Jewish, uh, from the Jewish um, sources like the Talmud, uh, they, have, uh, they treat past resurrections as being the same. Uh, the resurrections in Ecclesiastes, for example, in the Talmud, uh, are regarded as being resurrections. So um, I don't agree that there's this difference between resuscitation and resurrection terminologically. Uh, it's only conceptually, and it's only uh, what we see from Paul and people like him, and that's the basis of my actual position. I don't know if you'd allow for Can I respond to that? Yeah. Excellent. I hope so. Hey, as, long as, as long as you're hot and cooking, I'll let you know if it doesn't work. Go ahead. Well, some, certain of these words that he's quoting from um, secular writers here, like uh, Plutarch and, or Plato and Plutarch, these are Gentile writers, or these are, these are pagan writers, okay? They're non-Jewish. That's so, why I included Jewish sources up there. Right. I just meant to attest that the exactly, Greek, words, the like Greek the words existed in the Greek language. That right, was but my the Maccabean point. ones that you mentioned, 
anastasis is used there as well. And you look at Maccabee, 2 Maccabees 7 and 14 and what they're talking about there, the brothers who die and they get their tongue cut off, they get their arms chopped off, and they say, hey, we're going to receive these in the afterlife. God's going to yeah. get them back. It's definitely I, I referred agree. to bodily. I agree. That, that is the rabbinical view, and that's what you find in the Talmud. But it's used with the same... Uh, but the fact that they use both words, whereas Paul never uses any of these other words for resurrection, I think that's peculiar. And I think it fits more uh, the th idea that Paul conceived of resurrection as a going up into a new body. And that's, that's all I'm saying. Okay, one of the questions that, uh, that came from the audience was just asking each of you very briefly uh, to present uh, your credentials for talking about the Greek language in the first century. Okay. Um, well, I have a Master of Arts in New Testament history, but um, that really started off and almost completed as a Greek in New Testament Greek, Koine Greek. And in fact, I have uh, 10 courses graduate courses in New Testament Greek and Koine Greek. And afterward, I, I didn't know whether I wanted to stay with Christianity. I, I just loved studying Greek, but I thought, wow, I didn't know if this stuff's really true. And that's when I began going through my intense questioning and, and so forth. I ended up finishing up in New Testament history because I did my thesis on the historicity of the resurrection. So it was more of apologetics, but all my classwork was specializing in Koine Greek. And I've studied it now for 21 years. Mm. Okay, Richard. Uh, slide 71, please. <laughs> hey, look out. This man has a slide for everything. <laughs> Those are my qualifications. Um, two years ancient Greek studies at, uh, at Berkeley. Uh, I've had a year of papyrology under, under one of the world's leading papyrologists, uh, Roger Bagnall at Columbia. Uh, and most papyri, by the way, is written in Koine, uh, very badly written in Koine. Uh, the, uh, I've had one year Greek dialects and linguistics. This is the study of all the different dialects, uh, Koine among the others, and comparing them morphologically, etymologically, and uh, phono phonologically. And I've had uh, Greek manuscripts and paleography under uh, Leonardo Taran, who's a, uh, another leading scholar at Columbia. And I've had three years specialized personal training at Columbia in uh, Koine uh, texts, the New Testament, Josephus, Plutarch, Lucian, Diogenes Laertius, uh, Sextus Empiricus, and some church fathers are the ones that I've studied. That's it. Okay. So in short, in order to get the answer to some of these questions, we need to be in a seminar for the whole <laughs> quarter and discussing the text one by one and seeing exactly how words uh, function. Now, because it has become a truism uh, that individual words by themselves have relatively little meaning. That is to say, they have to be read in their context. The context is always... Uh, uh, it's not just a sentence even, it has to be a paragraph or a longer, uh, a longer passage in which uh, you know, we can see what people do. Um, I want to come back to another question to Lacona in just a minute, but uh, first of all then, I think it's only fair for me to ask uh, Carrie a hard question too. Yeah, please. Um, in light of your knowledge of the ancient world and your discussion of these documents, uh, how would you go about accounting uh, for the turnaround in the lives of the followers of Jesus uh, that led to the creation of a community, first of all, in Jerusalem, uh, that goes so much against the grain to reject social status as a basis for community, uh, that turns its back on temple sacrifice and worship, uh, begins to share goods with each other, uh, making sure that no one was in need, giving honor to each other rather than following through on conventional male socialization, uh, to seek honor for themselves and their families, uh, the rejection of patriarchal <coughs> obedience, and eventually following through on rejecting bloodlines as the basis for defining God's community. Now, that's a mouthful, but what yeah. I, was trying, I was trying to put some flesh on the idea that we see here a very powerful against the grain social revolution that's taking place that they say is, is sparked by their conviction that Jesus is alive. Um, well, that's a tough one to answer in a short period of time. Yeah. Uh, I'll stick to, the, to right. two Aristotelian categories here. Okay. Um, the efficient cause of that situation would be the hallucinations, the religious visions, and there's, this is very common in anthropological studies of ancient religion where uh, visions will appear to someone that will result in them coming up with an idea f to transform and change their society in fundamental ways. Uh, the idea of, well, we have uh, Joseph Smith, whether you believe he was a liar or really did see something. Uh, we have Muhammad, for example. Uh, there are a variety uh, of these. Uh, there's a lot of uh, vood the creation of Santeria, the um, Rastafarianism. A lot of these religions begin with uh, visions or uh, religious experiences, relig the feeling of the Holy Spirit and so forth that lead them to transform their society to, or to attempt to transform their society and to change fundamental aspects, things that they think are broken in society, to change them. 
Um, we have a lot of documented cases of this. And the efficient cause, what I would say, would be the hallucinations that it taught them or that, made, that gave them the, con the convincing belief that what Jesus was saying, that Jesus' idea for transforming society was right, was endorsed by God, and would work, and that they should strive and fight to the death to make it happen because it was right and it was the good thing for Israel. That's the efficient cause. The, the final cause would be the reason why, uh, whether this was consciously understood or subconsciously understood, um, I believe that uh, there were two principal problems facing Judea at this time in the, in the 30s AD. One was the complete corruption or near complete corruption of the temple cult which was controlled by uh, various Jewish factions that were essentially making money off of the organization and were not really looking after the interests of the moral reform of society which is what the temple was supposed to be. So to change this you needed to either gain military control of the temple which was impossible, the zealots attempted it, uh, but uh, the Romans were simply too powerful, and this was the other problem. You couldn't overcome the Romans. You could probably hope for a miracle from God, uh, but otherwise, if, if that wasn't the case, the other way to do it would be to change it from the ground up. And I think the whole idea, the really clever idea that the Christians came up with, or at least maybe Jesus came up with, was the idea that if you get rid of the temple cult, you eliminate the control, the power, the uh, ability to pull the strings of the Jewish elite, and you eliminate the role of the Roman question. You can transform society from the ground up. And if you look at the, the, the ideology in the New Testament, especially the epistles, Jesus completely replaces the temple cult. He serves every single function that the temple cult originally served, and he serves it by his dying and his resurrection. He is the new Passover lamb. He is the new resurrection. People who join him become the new Israel. And this is their way to sort of subvert society and sort of get things right back the way they wanted. And a lot of the things that they wanted to change were exactly the things that poor people wanted to change. Uh, they didn't like the idea of status giving people different powers and positions. They wanted equality. They, wanted, uh, they didn't want wealth to be a factor to lord it over to other people. They wanted uh, sort of a communal situation where everybody would be treated equally. Every, nobody would be wealthier than anybody else. This was their idea of justice. And there were a lot of groups in the ancient world that wanted this. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. And so that was the original motivation for Christianity, was to uh, get this new moral transformation of society. And there were two ways to do it. One was to take over the temple by force. The other was to transform it from the bottom up by replacing the temple cult with a new thing, something that the elites could not control. And the elites could not control a spiritual Christ. Could I respond to that? Uh, absolutely, sure. Yep. Keep it going. Um, yeah, we, as far as that definition, what his explanation, I mean, it's certainly an explanation, but I don't think it's the best one by any means. Uh, back then, when you, there were a lot of uh, alleged messiahs, and as Bill Craig points out, um, there were many messiahs that came along and they got killed. And when they got killed, uh, when your messiah died, you either found another messiah or you went home. And so what happens here we have with the Christians is their Messiah is now dead, and according to the rabbinic interpretation of Deuteronomy 21, 23, cursed is any man who is hung on a tree or a cross here. They, as Jews, would have had to look at Jesus and say, he was cursed by God. This couldn't have been the same Messiah that we were looking for. And so the explosion of Christianity afterwards um, is just phenomenal, and it's very difficult to explain without appearances and without an empty tomb. Now, he mentions about the appearance. He says you got the Rastafarians, Mormonism, Islam. They're all based on visions. But these aren't good parallels. They're poorly evidenced. They're poorly attested. And there's no enemy attestation. Regarding hallucinations, as I pointed out before, they don't account for the empty tomb. They don't account for the conversion of the church persecutor Paul. And they don't account for the conversion of the skeptic James. Um, well, of course, there is no enemy attestation of the empty tomb. It's not in any document that is not written by a Christian. Uh, first of all. Um, and secondly, the reason Jesus had to be cursed by God is that he had to be the sacrificial lamb. He had to carry away the sins of Israel, so he had to be uh, treated as a sinner. But you notice the fundamentals of the Christian doctrine was that he was punished unjustly, that he was not truly a sinner. But nevertheless, by submitting himself to the justice system, by actually undergoing the punishment that a sinner would undergo, even though he wasn't a sinner, allowed him to, trans to take our sins away with him. And this was the whole idea behind it. Now, the reason the other messiahs didn't get this uh, thing started is because they didn't think of it. Uh, I think Jesus is the one who preached this idea that, look, 
uh, if we replace the temple cult, we solve all these problems. Now, if you look at the other messiahs that Josephus reports, they all try to lead military movements to regain control of the temple. I think that's exactly what the Christians did not do. They tried to change things from the ground up, and the way to do that was to, change, was to replace the temple cult, and they did it by replacing it with a spiritual Jesus. And I, it's possible that Jesus came up with this idea, but even if he didn't, it's very possible that his followers came up with it, possibly through inspiration, because uh, it's very clever. Well, that's pretty interesting. Unfortunately, there's no evidence for it. And well, I, I when think you say there that is. there's no enemy attestation by a non-Christian source, I, just because we don't have a document doesn't mean that we can't believe what we read in a couple of sources. I mean, you in your writings quote uh, Plato on one book and say, yeah, we don't have this work, but he's, uh, Eusebius quotes him, and Eusebius well, is a Christian source. So we do have Matthew reporting that says the Jewish leadership said the disciples stole the body, and they were still saying it to his day. But why doesn't Acts list this accusation? Why does no other Christian document in the first century mention this accusation? Why does no Jewish document include this accusation? Why is it not in any actual enemy source? And when we do find polemic, Jewish polemic, in the Talmud, for example, or in any source, it never mentions this. It always mentions other attacks on Christianity, like, for instance, uh, attacks against the trial. Um, right, but unfortunately, the Talmud is hundreds of years later, and just yes, about every scholar admits the, the that the point, Talmud has very please, little historical authenticity to it. The, the, the point, though, I'm making is that you can't claim that there's enemy attest attestation when there isn't. I mean, you're saying that a Except Christian Except for Tertullian claimed, and, and Justin, who reports that Joe, who get the, the idea from Matt, I mean, they're, they're getting the thing from Matthew. No, they said they were yeah. still going on in their I mean, own it, day. It seems to me that, you know, that if we, if we had a, a non-believer who believed that God raised Jesus from the dead, he wouldn't be a non-believer anymore. I mean, it, 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 we're going in circles uh, here. I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't understand, I don't understand what you're saying. Well, if we're looking for a non-believing testimony uh, to... No, no, no. We're, to, we're talking about a non-believer who's, who's accusing them of stealing the body. So we're talking oh, about unbelievers. We're not talking about believers. Uh, we don't have any actual first century document or any Jewish source, in fact, that accuses the Christians of stealing the body. Even, even Acts does not mention this accusation, mm -hmm. even though Acts records a lot of the Jewish yeah, attacks yeah, on the church. Point, right. Okay, one more then for... Uh, 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 for uh, for Mike, and, and then another one for uh, Richard, and then uh, I've been interspersing these other questions as well, so some of the, some of the questions from the floor are already being answered. Um, one passage that has always uh, fascinated me is in Matthew 28, uh, where it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Mm. Uh, you know, that's something that Matthew could have skated over real easy. You know, mm -hmm. Three words that a lot of people would have been glad if he were left out of the narrative. Uh, what do you do with that? Okay, that's a very good question, and I, I have wrestled with that. For well over a century, Greek exegetes have recognized that the Greek there, hoi de, can refer to two different groups. Now, of course, that could be some of the disciples who worshipped him and the others who doubted, but it could also mean the disciples as one group and others who weren't the disciples who were the ones who doubted. The Greek word is distadzo, and it's used one other time in, in the New Testament. In fact, that's in Matthew, the same author that appears just a couple chapters before with Peter walking on the water. Peter's out on the water. He sees the waves. He begins to doubt, and then the, um, he begins to sink. But notice that he doubts while he's having faith, while he's out there. So the Greek word distadzo means two, to think two things simultaneously. Um, now, there's one other explanation that I find even uh, more convincing, and this is that um, this appearance takes place in Galilee, which is a three days walk from Jerusalem. And so what you have, perhaps, is the disciples meet Jesus in Galilee, see him for the first time. Then they go into Galilee and they meet Jesus there, um, and he appears to them. And those who doubted were others who were in Galilee. This is Jesus' hometown. Mm. And so they see Jesus there, and one guy says, man, isn't this remarkable seeing Jesus? Can't you hear this discussion going on? And the non-believer says, well, what do you mean? I mean, we've seen him here before, but you don't get it. He was crucified just a week ago in Jerusalem. Yeah, right. I see him right here. Yeah, but he's risen from the dead. So the thing is, they may, they may have doubted the resurrection because they doubted his death to begin with, uh, not because they looked and saw this ethereal mm. um, type of visionary experience at this point. And so that's how I would explain yeah. that. You want to comment on that, Richard? Yeah, I, I, I don't think Matthew was writing history. I think that he's comparing Jesus to Moses on Mount Sinai. Jesus is the new Moses on the new Sinai. That's why he's on a mountain. Uh, 
uh, the, some who doubted are, is, is an allusion to those who uh, went to the golden calf in the uh, famous story of the Ten Commandments. Um, the some who doubted are the ones who are going to die because they don't believe. Uh, and we know Matthew compared Jesus to Moses. He has the whole flight to Egypt scenario. The Herod tried to kill him, very similar to the way Moses was tried to be killed. Um, so I think Matthew is sort of painting a, a story where Jesus is the new Moses. So I don't think there's any sort of historical uh, support here for either of our positions in, in Matthew's account. I uh, follow uh, Dr. Talbert, who argues that the genre of the Gospels is myth, uh, certainly of Matthew and Mark. I don't think that they are, even thought they were writing history. Luke is a different story, but uh, Ma Mark and Matthew, I'm pretty sure, uh, were writing uh, myth. Well, as you know, C.S. Lewis taught at Oxford. He had studied, and he said he studied myth, legend, and romance all of his life. And he says when a person says that the Gospels are myth, he distrusts them at critic, as critics because he has studied and read myth and legend all his life. And he says, I can tell you, not one of these reads like the Gospels. Well, I, I would say uh, don't read a 50-year-old author. Read a modern author. Uh, Dr. Talbert's book, uh, What is a Gospel? is extremely well researched, extremely well documented, and his argument is very good. I highly recommend the book. It goes into great detail showing how uh, the whole genre, the structure, the nature, the themes, the, uh, the form of the narrative, uh, the kind of language that's in the Gospels is, fits that of myth much better than it fits that of history. The one exception I would personally make is Luke, where I think Luke is consciously mimicking the genre of history. And if you read Luke and compare it to, say, Mark, you really see the difference. But if you want to see the differences lined out one by one, uh, read Talbert's book. Talbert also wrote a book on uh, the genre of Luke. Uh, I can't recall the title of it right now, but I'm sure if you, if once you find what is a gospel, uh, you will be able to find the author and then find his other works. Well, regarding Good. Talbert, you said similar things about Dennis McDonald's book in your online writings, and we saw that that was full of holes, too. Well, well I, wait a minute. I should, I should, please, point, out, please, I should please. point out that Dennis McDonald, uh, I believe Dennis McDonald is right on some things. I do not say on my website, and I've never advocated that he's right about his interpretation of the resurrection doctrine, particularly the empty tomb. I don't think he has a prescient view. So in fact, I would actually agree with some of your criticisms of McDonald on that point. That does not discredit McDonald's finding of uh, parallels, for example, in the feasts and so forth. Uh, there are other issues that McDonald, I think, does get right. I don't think we can reject him completely just because he gets a few things a little uh, uh, iffy. Uh, Talbert, by the way, makes a much better case than McDonald. I, I would read Talbert first. Mm -hmm. Okay, a new question uh, for uh, Carrier. Uh, since no claims uh, were made, as far as we know, for the resurrection of the great Jewish teachers Hillel and Shammai, uh, why do you think that such a claim was made about Jesus of Nazareth? Uh, why he was resurrected and not them? Yeah, why, I mean, why? Well, that, that's like why? I said before. I mean, no one else thought of it. Um, it, it, it's the same reason, you know, why, why didn't uh, anyone else think that the Rastafari king of Ethiopia was, was the second coming of Christ except the Rastafarians? Um, you know, it's, they're the ones who thought of it. Uh, the same thing, uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph Smith, I mean, no one else came up with Mormonism. That was his uh, thing. It didn't get duplicated. The Heaven's Gate cult, uh, no one else thought that there was a spaceship coming to get them uh, flying behind Comet Hale Bop. That was their idea. Uh, I think the same thing goes for Christianity. The Christians came up with the idea first. Um, and I think, uh, for example, Hillel and so forth uh, belonged to a completely different sect of Judaism that would have been much more hostile to the idea in much the same way that Paul was. And that's why I think it's so rare to find someone from that sect converting and joining Christianity like Paul. And he's the only example of a persecutor Are, are you talking about the sect of the Pharisees, sir? I'm sorry, what? Are you talking about the sect of the Pharisees in which uh, Hillel and Shammai were big leaders in which Paul of Tarsus yes, was well, a member? Yes, yeah. well, of the, of the rabbinical texts, whatever, yeah. whichever sect you want to plug them in, they, they yeah. don't uh, share a lot of the similar doctrines of the Essenes, for example. This is true. You want to say anything about that? Or yes, go uh, okay. as far as no one else thought of it. Well, uh, most scholars believe that um, the disciples or, or, and those claiming that Jesus' resurrection, they wouldn't have said resurrection in their day. They may have said Jesus had been exalted into heaven, but they wouldn't have claimed resurrection because the Jewish thought was that the resurrection was going to happen on the last day. And so it appears that the disciples, when they saw Jesus resurrected, that this, this was quite confusing to them. And as N.T. Wright argues in The Resurrection of Son of God, he argues for an early dating of the Gospels, or not the Gospels, I'm sorry, but the resurrection narratives in the Gospels. He says they even probably predate Paul because there's, they are just not theologically adorned because when you look at crucifixion and stuff like that, they all had reasons to account for 
um, the crucifixion. They were able to relate it back to prophecies and like, um, or accounts in Psalm 22 and in Isaiah, uh, his description of a crucified victim that way. But you don't find that with the resurrection. They're not even quoting the scriptures there because they seem, they're, they're still trying to piece this together. How can this happen in our day? And you would think that if they were making this up, if this was this new idea that they came up with, they would have been finding scriptures to do that. But we find that that happens later on in Acts, but we don't find it in the resurrection narratives in the gospels. Well, the resurrection narratives in the gospels, well, for example, Mark, uh, he does borrow a lot of phrases and concepts that are clear markers back to other things, as I pointed out. He's getting the idea from uh, ancient texts. Uh, for example, his, the fact that he starts the narrative with the phrase, on the first day of the week, using a very unusual uh, form of the thing. It's like, on the first from the Sabbaths, which is a very strange way to put it. It's identical, word for word, from uh, Psalm, uh, I believe, 24 in the Septuagint. Um, so it's very strange that even though Paul is saying that it's on the third day of the week, Mark changes it to the first day using the exact same phrase, on the first from the Sabbaths. So clearly Mark is creating this parallel with Psalm 24, as I pointed out earlier. So this is the kind of uh, theological adornment we find. I mean, it's, it's the idea that we're taking these symbols uh, that have cultural meaning at the time and putting them all together to convey something. It's, I would say it's more like a parable than anything. Uh, but it draws on one's knowledge of the scriptures, uh, and that's, that's the kind of theological endowment I'm talking about. Um, whether the Gospels existed in Paul's day, I mean, Paul never refers to them, he never refers to the stories in them, so we really can't make any, uh, any claims based on any actual evidence that the Gospels or the stories existed before Mark, for example. Well, as far as Mark, uh, Paul being unaware of the stories in the Gospels, Paul, you got to look at Paul's reason for writing. He's not trying to write a biography for Jesus. Apparently, he may have thought that this had already been done, and um, he didn't need to do it. Besides, he wasn't there during Jesus' ministry, and so he's not qualified in a position as the disciples would have been to do that. He's writing concerning issues in the churches, and so, um, but he, he may be aware of them. Um, at least in First Timothy, I think it is, or Second Timothy, and even if this isn't Pauline, I, I think it probably is, but even if it isn't, it's still Pauline thought behind it, and he even quotes Luke there, so um, I, I think that uh, he is aware of it. On the third day of the week is in the, uh, he doesn't say on the third day of the week, he says on the I'm, third day. I'm sorry, you're right, yeah, okay. that was my mistake. Um, okay. And that appears to be the earliest. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, uh, to pick up one of the questions from the floor now, and, uh, and to pursue, it turns out that this is a question that, that, that tags right on to the end of Richard's uh, last uh, wrap up, and this is addressed to you, Mike. Why uh, in God's design is Jesus' resurrection relatively so private and Jesus' crucifixion so relatively public? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> All right. I don't know. I do know that um, you know, Jesus' crucifixion was public for certain. Uh, his resurrection occurred to both disciples, but it also, uh, it, you also have an enemy um, of Christianity, uh, one who hated Jesus, Paul, and he reports that he experienced a post-mortem appearance of Jesus and so did the skeptic James as well. Mm -hmm. but, but Paul doesn't report uh, touching wounds or seeing Jesus eat or Jesus saying that he wasn't a spirit or uh, f flying up into heaven or any of those things. Um, all of the evidence that Christ, that the appearance was of a, of a flesh and blood body are not in Paul. Paul's talking about a vision. Even Acts depicts it as a vision. Um, now I'd like to bring up slide 22 to sort of bring emphasis to this question that was asked. I mean, this, let's put the question this way. According to Lacona's theory, the God of the universe, the whole universe, who loves us all and came to preach a message of salvation to all mankind, appeared in his resurrection body in only one tiny place in the whole of the civilized world, in, at only one time in all of human history, to only a small number of people, almost none of whom were hostile or neutral observers, and all of whom were superstitious people lacking in scientific understanding. Now, I think... This is very improbable unless you see it as not the God of the universe, but as natural hallucinations of them believing that they were seeing the God of the universe. The actual God of the universe would have done things radically differently, at least I would expect. Okay, well, you mentioned about Acts, and, or that Paul said it was a vision. You didn't establish that. In fact, I showed that that was wrong. He said bodily resurrection. 
Moreover, Acts, you said, uh, depicts uh, this uh, appearance to Paul as a vision. No, um, this is a post-ascension appearance, and that, that does make a difference right there, because the disciples said that they saw Jesus right after he had risen from the dead prior to his ascension. Paul says he saw Jesus from heaven. Plus, it, um, in the three records, you have, um, it says that, uh, Paul saw the, uh, the others, his traveling companions, saw the light and heard the voice. They just didn't understand the voice. So this couldn't have been a vision because the others uh, participated as well, and it's just like dreams in that way. Uh, you couldn't wake up your wife in the middle of the night and say, Honey, I'm having this dream. We're in Hawaii. Join me in my dream, and we'll have this free vacation. Um, um, visions are private occurrences. Um, you said, well, they're all superstitious. Well, that's a classic ad hominem argument. And by that, you, you could say that um, um, no ma even if they did have it, you said, well, these guys are superstitious, so there'd be no way of showing that they really did have uh, a legitimate, genuine encounter with the risen Jesus. And the same thing today. I mean, if I said I saw Jesus today, you'd say, well, you're just superstitious. Well, that's, you're, not, you're that's, not, what I'm, that's not what I'm arguing. Um, I'm just saying that... Uh, for God to choose people who were particularly superstitious relative to today. I mean, if God appeared today, uh, if God appeared right here, right now, I mean, I wouldn't regard myself as superstitious. I mean, that would be much better evidence. But you if would you just have, say we're all having a collective hallucination. Not necessarily. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that. It would depend on the situation. I do believe it's possible to prove things like that a vision is a real vision of a real God. Uh, it depends on the nature and scale of the evidence. I don't think we have that kind of evidence in this particular case. That's all I'm saying. Now, what I would like to respond is uh, the post-ascension argument. Paul never says his appearance was post-ascension. In fact, Paul never says any appearances were before the ascension. Paul never makes any distinction between resurrection or ascension. Uh, in all of his creeds, he says uh, that uh, Christ uh, died and then uh, was, um, was ascended to heaven. He doesn't have a resurrection and then appearances and then ascension. The idea that Paul's view vision was only post-ascension appears only in Luke, which, of course, is the guy who's arguing that the body, uh, that Christ rose in the flesh. So he has to have... Yeah, but it's the uh, same one where it. Paul is giving the testimony because Paul doesn't yes, well, give a specific one that, in his writings. That does bring up slide 72, please. You've got to get some slides. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, Paul, Paul never says anything to even suggest it. Um, he equates his visions with others, his creeds. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Well, okay, that's what I just argued, actually. I yeah, have another one. That's fine. Um, slide 72, please. No, I'm sorry. 43, thank you. Now, uh, the account in Acts is not something that I find very reliable. I was just talking with someone uh, in the break uh, why I didn't use more evidence in Acts, for example, that Paul's vision was a form of epilepsy. One can argue that, for example, in Acts, Paul uh, sees a bright light, he's knocked down, he's temporarily blinded, he hears voices. These are symptoms of various things like temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, one could argue this. Uh, I chose not to because I don't trust Acts, actually. Acts was written by a sarcissist, um, and one who I don't trust is very reliable. Um, and one but you quoted to him to support your view. The very uh, text that you don't Luke? think is reliable. Are you talking about Luke or Acts? Acts. What, what are you, you quoted, talking about? quoted uh, Paul's conversion experience. Well, no, uh, and I think there's a reason why Acts uh, actually includes Paul's vision in that weird way, uh, unlike all the other appearances in Luke, and, but I, because I think Luke was facing an actual tradition history for Paul uh, when he gets to that, and that's why he has to make the vision different. Now, if we look at, compare Paul's account in Galatians versus Acts, he doesn't mention there being any attendance. He denies meeting anyone, much less Ananias. He places his return to Jerusalem with Barnabas years later, and there's no suggestion of danger. So the, uh, the, Paul's account of his vision and the account in Acts are very different, and that's why I don't trust Acts' account entirely. Uh, I think that if there's any evidence in Acts regarding Paul's vision, it's that it was a vision and not a contact with flesh and blood Christ. Well, the thing that came later, though, that's 17 years after he allegedly had his experience. And... Um, when, when you appeal to Acts to say that Paul had this, this vision, uh, which you could interpret as a hallucination, or that Paul didn't think of it this way because he thought of it as a vision, uh, you just go to Acts 13, and, and Paul very clearly says there uh, that it's bodily resurrection. He contrasts uh, risen Jesus with King David. He said, David died, was buried, his body decayed. Jesus, on the other hand, died and was buried, but his body did not decay. Rather, God raised it up, and if that were all eyewitnesses, he couldn't have been more clear about bodily resurrection. 
And finally, about the epilepsy, the temporal lobe epilepsy, I asked a doctor about this some time ago, and he said he had worked extensively with epilepsy patients, and he said when you, when you have epilepsy, you don't remember your seizures. Um, there is no thought about a, a bright light or hearing a voice or anything. You don't remember anything about the experience at all, so I don't know where you're getting this from. Well, I, I was referring to someone else's theory, not one that I actually defended. Um, because I don't actually trust Axe as a source. Would you bring slide 52, please? Well, well wait um, a minute, though. You made this claim about epilepsy, and then you say, well, I don't know that I, you, don't, you say you don't know that you believe it after all. Why bring it up? No, I, I mentioned it because I was talking about someone else who said, why didn't I make that argument? I had, that's what I was talking about. I said, someone had asked me in the break why I didn't make that argument, and I was explaining that I didn't because I don't trust Axe. Um, okay. Now, if you, if you have that, I have, I'd like to bring up this other point. You, you mentioned a particular passage in Acts. If you look at Acts 16.10, I, I mean, if we don't need to go into this, but if you look at the slide, um, what happens in Acts is he's, uh, Luke takes a passage in Psalms that doesn't really say what Luke uh, then interprets it to say, and he interprets it in a completely different way, and he puts these words in the mouth of Peter, uh, arguing that the uh, resurrection was a resurrection of the flesh. I mean, this is the kind of thing that Luke is doing. He's distorting the record to argue for his particular position, uh, and, and this is the reason why I don't really trust Acts as a source. Yeah, okay. Uh, I can assure the people here of two things. One is that uh, I do plan to shut down the open meeting at, uh, at 5 after 10, which will be in about 12 minutes, so you can count on that, uh, which doesn't mean that the speakers are going to vanish, but uh, it'll be on a private basis. Uh, the second thing is I can assure you, too, that many of the questions that you've asked have been answered as these people have been dialoguing with each other, and I have to congratulate them with the civil way in which they are discussing very important issues. This is uh, one of the best debates I've ever been present at. I congratulate you guys. All right, this is a question for Carrier, uh, especially uh, appropriate in light of the fact that on both sides, N.T. Wright's book, the most recent book, has been uh, referenced. Uh, the question goes like this. N.T. Wright argues that the Jews believed in a physical resurrection because it would be a reaffirmation of the physical world as good. Uh, this theme is echoed uh, throughout the New Testament of the world being restored. Uh, heaven, therefore, is not a physical place, but the place from which God's plans and future comes from. How then do you explain an idea of spiritual resurrection as a reaffirmation of creation, uh, as it is clearly argued and affirmed in the New Testament? Well, Paul uh, doesn't actually defend that view himself. His view appears to be very similar to uh, a very common view in the ancient world that uh, everything below the lunar orb, everything below the moon, was doomed to corruption and it was uh, subject to decay, whereas everything above the orb of the moon was perfect and uh, indestructible and eternal, uh, using the same kind of language that Paul uses about the two bodies. I think there's uh, views like Paul's which hold that, uh, and for, for example, we see this clearly in Philo, uh, where the idea is that everything on earth is bad, but it's going to be replaced with something so much better, and that's what Paul's arguing. Uh, it's not a reaffirmation of the old creation, although to Paul the creation served the purpose of God and working his way towards the new creation uh, when he's going to remake the world and make it a hell of a lot better and give us very much better bodies. Mm -hmm. A question that was addressed to both of you um, that you've touched on but perhaps have not uh, answered definitively. Uh, as you understand it, is it possible for a group of people to have similar hallucinations? And related to that, then, was a question uh, that runs like this. I don't have it right before me, but the content is in my head. Namely, uh, that if it had been the intention of the early, early followers of Jesus uh, to, um, to manufacture a particular understanding of Jesus being alive, uh, why is it there is so much diversity in the reports of uh, the experiences? So first of all, is it possible for a group of people to have similar hallucinations? And secondly, why then? Uh, in any case, is there such a diversity in the reports of their experiences? Well, there's an example cited in the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is the one that comes to my mind most immediately, of uh, lifeboat survivors all come being completely convinced that they're seeing a ship on the horizon, uh, and they all think they're seeing the same ship uh, because it's caused by uh, memory contamination. What will happen is someone will say they see something, and then another person will, will suddenly be inspired by suggestion to see it. And the more they talk about it, the more that they infect each other regarding the details of this hallucination, uh, so that they, they both become convinced that they have seen the same thing, even though, I mean, if we could jump into their minds, we probably wouldn't be seeing exactly the same thing. 
Uh, and this is uh, similar to um, a lot of hallucinatory situations such as uh, in the voodoo cults where a lot of people are possessed by spirits and so forth and claim to be enjoying the same spirit uh, embodying them or Pentecostals being possessed by the Holy Spirit. They think it's the same spirit, of course, uh, but it's all telling them different things. Um, so there are, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. I, whether there's a possibility that everyone can actually hallucinate exactly the same thing, I'm not sure. I wouldn't even know how you would test that. Uh, and we don't have the kind of information we would need uh, to test that in this particular case, whether what they saw was exactly identically the same or whether it just was believed to have the same content. Uh, regarding the second point, uh, the diversity, uh, I believe, because the Gospels are the genre of myth, uh, that the different way the stories are constructed is because each author has a different way of developing the parable, and he's creating different messages. For example, Matthew uh, wants to paint Jesus as the new Moses. Uh, Mark has the Orphic parallel that he wants to make and so forth. Luke, of course, has the Sarcissist dogma that he wants to enforce. And because they all have different objectives and different agendas, and of course because there's no historical tradition for them, uh, un or uh, hardly any historical tradition for them to toe the line to, they're all pretty much coming up with different things, and that's why we have different stories. Well, the Britannica article was from 1962, 42 years ago. And if you didn't like C.S. Lewis, who was writing around the same time, I don't know why you like Britannica. Yeah, well, it's regarding still, well, it's a difference between science and and a theologian. I mean, we're talking about documented science here. It's whether it's 1962 or not, it's still scientific documentation. Well, a lot of changed in science over the last 42 years. Well, yes, but if you have a documented case of a mass hallucination in 1962, it's a documented case. It's well, scientific. it's not because I I read that case in Britannica, and it just says they were having hallucinations but uh, of a ship over there but I'll tell you what it, you know if that ship got closer and they started looking and they saw that the same hall number was there then I'd say it's time for them to start yelling out because it's a real ship now regarding similar hallucinations I had an opportunity to talk to a number of Navy SEALs I live in Virginia Beach we have uh, several of the Navy SEALs stationed there for the SEAL teams and they tell me that when they're going through Hell Week they go through a um, uh, a time where they're not sleeping. They only get three to five hours of sleep the, the entire week. Not every night, but the entire week. And during that time, most of the SEALs, probably 80% of them, experience hallucinations due to sleep deprivation. So they're, and they usually do it at the same place when they're all out in this raft just uh, rowing. It's actually happened to me, by the way. I've had okay. a hallucination. You're a Navy SEAL? No. Uh, I've, had, I've, had, <laughs> I've had sleep deprivation hallucination. Okay. So, what, well, yeah, so I mean, that, that's pretty common. In the common. military, but not the SEALs. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's pretty common to have sleep, uh, uh, sleep deprivation, hallucinations. The thing is, here all these guys are in the same frame of mind. They're, um, they're, they're all, 80% are hallucinating, but it's interesting when you talk to them, they're not hallucinating the same thing. One guy said he saw an octopus come out of the water and wave at him. Another thought he saw a train coming across the water, and he actually rolled out of the boat because he couldn't convince the rest of the guys who were in the same frame of mind that they saw it. Another guy told me, he was a lieutenant, and he said he distinctly remembered a guy waving his paddle near, and people said, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm trying to hit the dolphins that are jumping over the boat. And he said, well, did you see the dolphins? No. Did anyone else see the dolphins? No, they were having their own hallucinations. So they have these group hallucinations. They're all in the same frame of mind, but they're different hallucinations. Thus, when we have multiple uh, sources attesting to the group hallucinations that are, I'm sorry, the group appearances that the disciples were having, these couldn't have been hallucinations because hallucinations are private occurrences like dreams, but yet the accounts we have said they saw Jesus, they reported what he was saying, and these agree with each other. Well, I, I think it's a mistake in reasoning to assume that because a lot of group hallucinations aren't of the same thing, that there are no group hallucinations that are of the same thing. And I think in a situation where there's a cultural circumstance, especially if there's a powerful leader and a particular common shared motivation to hallucinate the same thing, uh, that that leader can inspire through memory contamination and suggestion people to think that they're experiencing the same thing, especially if the experience is similar to the Pentecostal one uh, described in Luke. I'm which, sorry, but what you're talking about is delusion, not hallucination. And that's an entirely well, different no, psychological I mean, it, phenomenon. It, what the point is that they thought that they were experiencing the spirit of Christ. I mean, that's, that's the point. Whether what our technical term for it is, what they thought was that they were seeing Jesus. That's, that's the point. Yeah, but it, so are you saying they're having a hallucination or a delusion? Well, I, I'm not going to get into a technical debate over what exact word to use. I, you can use either word you want. What I'm talking about is they it's a natural phenomenon different. versus... What's that? They are distinctly different. Besides, uh, whatever the case, neither of them account for the empty tomb. 
which does well, have evidence for it. I I've, know you don't agree I've, with it. I've but made the, my case on that, though. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, a follow-up question then um, uh, from Mr. Carrier. If, if Paul was hallucinating, uh, tired, et cetera, do you think he would risk his life um, on the basis of that kind of a, a hallucination? If he did not experience the power of the risen Christ in his life, uh, why would he risk his life and everything that he had worked for up until that time? Because Paul believed what he was doing was right. Um, you have to understand that in the ancient world, uh, Paul didn't think he was just going mad. He thought that God himself had talked to him. Uh, he took that seriously. There's a lot of people who have thought God was seriously talking to them, and they've done quite amazing things uh, right down to uh, submitting themselves to death because that's what they believed. Uh, the issue is what Paul believed. Um, there's a difference between what Paul believed and what we have uh, grounds to believe today. Now, maybe, uh, possibly, uh, God actually did appear to Paul, but we just don't have enough evidence to confirm that, whereas we have lots of evidence. We have no evidence, for example, uh, to confirm. Well, no, let's put it this way. There's no scientific confirmation that God has ever actually appeared to anyone, but we have lots of scientific confirmation that hallucinations can convince people that they've experienced God. Uh, so with, with the little amount of evidence we have, and it's not good at all, uh, we're in a situation where we have to decide what is more probable, that Paul encountered something that was natural and that we have scientifically demonstrated is common, or that Paul experienced something that we've never confirmed existed scientifically ever. Well, the thing is, we have to do, we have to work out as historians what the best, what can best account for why Paul changed his belief from a persecutor of the church to uh, one of its most greatest advocates. And it's not just Paul here that we're looking at. Sure, we can't prove it scientifically. I'm, you know, I'm sorry we didn't have video cameras back then. But Paul, it's not only Paul who says he saw it. If it was just Paul, that might be one thing. But it's also the skeptic James. It's also um, a number of different appearances to the disciples. And as I've argued, we have an empty tomb. Now, regarding the scientific thing, you know, we, we've seen the frequency probability of hallucinations versus appearances um, uh, of deity to people. Um, you know, today we, we know that you can't get something out of nothing. Uh, scientifically, we know that nothing produces nothing. Ex nihilo, nihil fit. But yet, the unanimous consensus, I shouldn't say unanimous, but uh, the overwhelming majority of cosmologists today, not cosmetologists, but cosmologists, those who study <laughs> the cosmos, agree that the universe came out of nothing, ex nihilo. And so the thing is, if we're going to go with the frequency probability argument that you suggest, it seems that the universe doesn't exist, and therefore we're not even talking. Well, I, th this is a whole different debate. Whether yeah, God indeed. exists or not yeah. is irrelevant. Maybe Muhammad exists. It has nothing to do with whether Jesus is risen from the dead. Yeah, I, I mean, but the, I didn't the point, say that the point is not whether God, God exists. There. I never said anything. I never even argued that God doesn't exist. All I argued that w was that we have no scientific evidence that God appears to people or performs miracles. That's the point. I mean, maybe God does exist and doesn't do those things. Or maybe he does exist and only does them for Muslims. We don't really know. I mean, that's a whole separate debate. Uh, but the point is, we've never scientifically confirmed that God appears to people, but we have scientifically confirmed that people believe God has appeared to them uh, through a natural phenomenon. So uh, that's my point. That's the basis that I rested my argument on. Well, I think okay. it kind of begs the question, though, because what we're looking at here, if you're looking for evidence that God has acted in history, um, y you can't say that we don't have that evidence because uh, we're looking at that very evidence right now regarding well, I'm, Jesus' I'm resurrection. I'm talking about scientific confirmation. We so have what, scientific confirmation of natural hallucination. We do not have scientific confirmation that God has really appeared to people. Uh, and when you have to do history, you have to do history based on the, what is established, what, what we have, what we know, and has been established scientifically, uh, based on norms. And that's why I say that the probability of a genuine appearance of God must be extraordinarily low because we haven't confirmed any of them. So that means that even if they really do exist, they must be really rare. Whereas hallucinations are really common. Uh, in Bayesian analysis, for example, this is uh, referred to as prior probability, and it affects the outcome of the calculation that any particular claim is true. And that's the reason I brought this up, is that it, uh, in order to overcome this low prior probability, you need a lot of really good evidence, and we just don't have that. Problem okay, is when we come gentlemen, to it's 5 after 10. I, I'm, oh, wow. I'm very willing to give each one of you a minute uh, to say what last you'd like to say to this fine bunch of people who've been listening to you all this time. Uh, who wants to go first? You want me to take it? Um, well, uh, for just a minute, uh, all I'd have to say is that uh, we didn't even touch the tip of the iceberg. Uh, 
Um, okay. All right. Uh, I, this particular theory that I have defended here today, uh, I argue at great length in a book that's coming out next summer uh, called Jesus is Dead. Uh, it's a book that will have chapters by numerous authors, uh, some well-known skeptics in the community. Uh, I have three chapters in there. Uh, one of them is this. It's a very extensive, very do well documented, uh, and it answers a lot of questions that were probably raised today but not answered. Uh, so keep your eye out for that. Okay. Well, I just want to thank you all for your patience in listening to us, and I, I have enjoyed this exchange. Thank you, Richard. This yes, has been yes. fun. Um, I, I've documented this, uh, my, side, my position, quite extensively in a new book published by Kriegel that should be in bookstores any day now called The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. And I co-authored this with Gary Habermas, perhaps the four, foremost authority in the world on the evidence for the resurrection. And um, uh, again, this is in, it should be in bookstores uh, um, within any day now. Um, if you would like a copy though, you're, you're welcome to email me at my website at risenjesus.com and uh, can hook you up with one. Please join me then in thanking these gentlemen for an excellent evening.